Hi, welcome to Plateau TV. I'm joined here with Jay the Stingray. Hey Jay, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me. Oh gosh, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, Jay, Jay, you pushed me to do this, so I'm uh, grateful for that. Um, you know, Plateau TV. This is where we're going to talk about um, you know all the TV that's worth watching. Uh, you know, we're all busy. We have jobs, lives, girlfriends, wives, whatever whatever the case might be. And there's just so much to watch. Uh, you know, I even include movies in that too. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about movies every now and again mm -hmm. too. But uh, you know, there's just so much on that it's kind of tough to figure out what should we be watching, what should we pay attention to. That um, you know, I have my own opinions on that. I'm sure you do too. And so I, I thought be it would be a good opportunity to uh, you know connect with the YouTube community and, and get that kind of information out there. Yeah, absolutely. I know we're both uh, big fans of uh, television, and there's so much great stuff out there. It's it's yeah. really hard to find time to even watch the good stuff, much less all the bad stuff we sit through. Oh yeah. I mean, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I, you know, it's like, even just, I have kind of like my, my solid stable of shows where it's like, these are the shows I'll watch them live. I think, I think even people who love, you know, certain shows, they still watch them the next day or whatever, but there are some shows that for me, I like them so much. I don't want to wait. I want to get them as soon as I, as soon as I can. So like in a good example of that would be like better call Saul. You know, I was a huge, oh, yeah. huge Breaking Bad fan, um, and I wasn't sure what to expect out of the spinoff of that. But uh, Better Call Saul has turned out to be a really good show. Um, I think in some ways, maybe even benefits from the fact that Breaking Bad existed before. I think the writing team, the creators, um, they, they really, I think, hone their craft. So I, I don't know that you can compare the two shows. I don't know that you'd want to. But mm -hmm. in some ways, I think Better Call Saul improves upon Breaking Bad. I mean, I think these guys have really figured out how to produce a great show, great pacing, great characters. Um, and that's just one example. Again, we're not just going to talk about Better Call Saul all the time, but I just use it as an I example. I actually haven't seen it yet, so it's it, it, it's on my list for sure. It's, oh, uh, wow. I was oh, a yeah, big Breaking gosh. Bad fan, so. Yeah, it's, yeah, um, what, season what? three now? Yeah, we're in the midst of season three. Better call Saul. Well, then I'll uh, I'll keep the spoilers to a minimum with you then. Um, but uh, <laughs> certain spoilers you'll uh, you'll sort of you'll you'll innately know it is a prequel. But um, yeah, no, solid show. I th I think if you if you maybe hesitated either because you were busy or you weren't sure how a spinoff of Breaking Bad would turn out, definitely let me just try and wash away your worries because it's really very good. Like it does a really great job. Yeah, I just. I mean, I, I wasn't really on the fence, you know, at all about it. I knew it was probably going to be decent. You know, I liked the the cast, but I just wasn't really in the mood for more Breaking Bad. You know, after the everything that we went through in the last season, there, that I yeah, may have split it, you know, into two different half seasons or something yeah. like that. They delayed it or you know, however they did it, but yeah, it was you know quite the uh, quite the journey there. Yeah, don't get me started on the the splitting the splitting of the final seasons that they were doing for a while. Cause they did that with Mad Men too. Another show oh, yeah. I like, mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't like this little game they were playing where every other season of the show, it was like, you know, 16 episodes or 13, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden for the last season, it's like, no, no, we're going to milk it. We're going to give you a seven and then we're going to give you eight or whatever. They all yeah. Do. It's, I mean, I guess it's AMC really, right? That's it. Yeah. Doing that. Well, I think well, actually, no, I guess it would be because well, walking dead has always done that. Um, and there's a show yeah. <laughs> I gave up on that show. Oh, I think, oh, I think, I think, yeah, I think, in fact, I don't know, you and I, we talk offline sometimes. I can't remember yeah. if you and I were talking about that. Um, or maybe we, we talked about it once or twice on the sausage factory, just one of those little side conversations that yeah, starts we, up. I know um, we talked about it early in the season and, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen anything past the, uh, the season break and you know, I know they finished the, the season, but, um, I I did not return to it officially. I think I watched some of the finale just out of pure interest. I wanted to see what they were going to do. Um, and frankly, my decision to leave, I think, was justified. Um, that's, I mean, that's a pretty big thing, right? You were a big fan of the show. I was a big fan. In fact, and so, you know, for, for the viewers, of which there's there's probably zero right now, one maybe, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty hardcore. If a show gets my loyalty... I watched that show through thick and thin. And as a big fan of Lost, 
who stuck with it during like season two, and there were some rough there were some rough patches in season two, trying to find stupid son's wedding ring in the sand and that kind of crap. You know, I I'm loyal. I stick with the show. And so, you know, another example would be uh, Smallville. Smallville is an example of a show that I watched and I really liked it. And to me, season two, maybe season two and three, I think were probably the top seasons of that show. Really good stuff. And then it just went off the cliff. Um, and I actually gave up on it. And it's, really? and it's, and I just, I mentioned it, it's like, it's so rare for me to do that. I don't give up on shows. Mm-hmm. I, I just, it's, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a completionist. I don't know what you call it, but maybe I'm a sucker. I, uh, yeah. I just, I don't usually give up on a show. So the fact that I gave up on The Walking Dead, I think should speak volumes. Like they just, I, they lost my, they kind of lost my respect in some sense. Mm-hmm. Like I, I really hold the writers responsible what? For, for what happened. The actors are just, performing the roles and acting out what they're given. I, I think the writers failed mm-hmm. seriously on that show. Well, it, it, it just feels like you're being toyed with, you know, a little bit when, when the way they, you know, with, I guess we can do a little bit of spoilers here. Uh, yeah. You know, the way they did Glenn's death, you know, the original, yeah. when they held it out for like what, three or four episodes before you even knew that he wasn't dead. Right. But, and uh, it, well, yeah. oh, oh, I know. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, that's right. So for, for the uninitiated, <laughs> Glenn, spoiler alert, did die. He died in the comics. They they kind of redid his death. Almost, you know, pretty pretty accurate to what happened in the comics, too, yeah. at least from a visual perspective. But earlier, the previous season, there was this odd fake out where they sort of led you to believe that he died, but he mm-hmm. didn't. And it all turned out to just be this really, it, it was all camera frame. It, it was cheap is what it mm-hmm. was. It was sort of you saw the character laying on the ground, and the camera was angled in such a way it looked like zombies were eating him, but really there was a body on top of him, and really what it was was cheap. It was cheap. It, yeah, it, it, was. it was. It was cheap, cheap TV, yeah. because I, you know, for a show like that, and I and I've seen the the writers and the producers on that show try to defend it. And try to like, well, you know, TV shows have cliffhangers all the time and they trick you. And it's like, well, that's true. It, it, you know, it's not like cliffhanger. You know, I, I'll take a cliffhanger. But to me, I don't know why a cliffhanger has to be a guy with a baseball bat, like getting ready to hit somebody. And it's like, oh, man, who's he going to hit? Like, that's the kind of stuff that TV used to do in like the 80s and 90s. You know, that's not, you know, they talk about this as being like the golden age of TV. That's not. You know, to me, that's that's cheap. You know, it's if you cheap, want to do a cliffhanger, you know, um, Battlestar Galactica. I don't know whether you ever watched that show, the the reboot they did of that back mm-hmm. in the mid two thousands or so. If you haven't, if you haven't watched it, maybe you're not a sci fi guy. But even if you're not, I actually still recommend it. We can talk yeah. a little bit about that. But I want I want to get into it. I've I've heard quite a few things about it. It is a really solid show. But I, I use that as an example because that was a show that. They did every now and again have some cliffhangers that were, you know, kind of standard TV stuff. But, but more often than not, their cliffhangers were more like philosophical about we're going to put you in a position, and then it's like what could happen next. So to me, I think The Walking Dead could have ended that season where they made us wait to find out that you know characters were going to die, and say you know ha- have them die, get them beaten to hell, and then it's like going into the next season. You know, it's not a cliffhanger where someone's, you know, hanging off a cliff, but it's, oh my gosh, like, what are our characters going to do now? Like, why isn't that enough of a story hook? Like, I, it, it feels to me like they're cheaply grabbing their audience and kind of forcing them. Yeah, hater alert. <laughs> hater alert. Um, it feels like, um... hey, Jay, can you uh, see me, by the way? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um <laughs> I, I was getting some outside feedback that my video is not showing up. I don't know what that's about. Uh-huh. Um, Let me check the video. You're fine on my end. Okay, good. All right, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, sorry, but uh, yeah, all, all, all I'm saying, the, the summary of what I'm saying is that, you know, the the Walking Dead writers, they just, they lost my respect. They I didn't feel like they were giving the audience respect. Um. Oh, oh it looks like some of the folks are saying that you can't see me. Interesting. I, I'll tell you what. Do you have me highlighted? Like, if you clicked on my screen there at the oh, bottom, is that highlighted. What's going on? I do. It, it does that. Yeah. It uh, will only show my. Oh, okay. I see. Is there a way to? Uh, <laughs> sorry, th- this is the first show, folks. So I am sorry about the, uh, yeah. the kinks here. Is there a way to get it to just randomize? 
Yeah, you could just un unclick it, and it should be uh, like uh, whoever speaks. There we go. It should go. There we go. I think we got it now. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, thanks, Piz. <laughs> the moderator, moderator extraordinaire, uh, Pizwell from go. the uh, the Sausage Factory good, helped get us get us right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, let's uh, let, let's let's get into kind of the meat of what we want to talk about here. So. Um, so Jay, like what's, what is your stable of shows? Like, what are you watching right now? Like what, what's your kind of go-tos at the moment? Well, right now I can tell you my, uh, we had, well, we had a little bit of free time on uh, Memorial day. So my wife and I, we, yep. we watched all of uh, crashing on HBO. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, I have heard Holmes, of it. I haven't seen it. Uh, Judd Apatow. Right. Um, really, a uh, really good show. You know, uh, Judd Apatow, I don't know if you're a, a fan of, uh, uh, comedians at all. But yeah. uh, Pete Holmes kind of has a unique style. He's kind of like a more uh, family oriented. Uh, well, that may not be the best choice of words, but they compare him to like Jim Gaffigan. It's, he's not really filthy comedy, you know. Yeah. Um, so more of a family friendly type comic, uh, somewhat. Well, so. well, hold on a second. Pete Holmes. He was the. Didn't he have a show after yeah. Conan or something <laughs> like that? He was on TBS yeah. for a while. Yeah, for what maybe six months. Uh, Six, eight months, yeah. Okay. Like uh, yeah. No. Pete Holmes is fun. actually that right. All right. I need to check this out. Mm -hmm. you, you know, your recommendation plus connecting who the guy is because mm -hmm. he used to do the uh, those little X Men vin vignettes, yeah, yeah. which I thought were really funny. Yeah, he did um, a lot of like Batman stuff too. <laughs> you are literally made of the material the guy we fight the most can manipulate with his mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, check those. I think those are on YouTube. Probably somewhere. Those are good. Um, okay, crashing. Oh, so you, what do you is it is it the whole season out yet, or are they still yeah the they're still going with those? It's okay. uh, thankfully it was one I could actually binge. So uh, you know it's a thirty minute something right around that area. So nice. something we're able to watch in an afternoon fairly easily. While the kids nice. went outside and played and left us alone for a little bit. But nice. um, yeah, I was uh, you know Judd Apatow uh, produces the show, directs uh, quite a few of the episodes, and. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, I listen to Pete Holmes' podcast, and I know quite a bit about his personal life because, you know, he, he talks about that, and it's a fairly autobi autobiographical show. So right. um, it's pretty much, you know, he uh, is uh, he, he catches his wife cheating on him, and uh, that actually happened to him. So a lot of that stuff is – Oh, wow. You know, and uh, T.J. Miller's in there. Um, oh, nice. Artie Lang, uh, lots of, you know, cameos of comics and stuff you'd probably recognize. Yeah, I do. Yeah, T.J. Miller from uh, Silicon Valley, and what is it? He has the Gore Burger show or something like that on Comedy Central now. Oh, really? I haven't seen that. I, I have to. Con I, I haven't seen it, and I'm not sure I want to. It's it, it's T.J. Miller, and he's kind of voicing this giant monster puppet guy. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't seen it, so I don't want to pass too much judgment. But it's is it, is it like animated? An animated no, it's it's an actual practical kind of oh, costume, okay. but hmm. he. Again, I, I don't know anything about the show. It just didn't seem to really attract me, even though T.J. Miller does it, and I think he's very funny. You know, he was in Deadpool. I thought he was great in that. Yeah. In fact, uh, he was. Um, they just announced he's not coming back for Silicon Valley season five, which to me that's that's horrible. He is a major component to that show. That's going to be tough to to kind of fill his shoes. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of an odd way to announce that. Um... You know, because they haven't even finished airing the season. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe they'll work that in somehow. But right. I'm a big fan of that show. I, I love all those guys. Yeah. I was a big I think, fan of uh, Camille Nangiani, and that's, that's really how I found the show. Yeah. I think – I don't know how it was I came onto the show, but I, I think I watched it through the first season. I think ever since – you know, ever since Game of Thrones has been on, I think that show ends – and because they initially attached it to Game of Thrones, that's how I got into it. And it was really good, so I stuck with it. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I am a loyal fan of that show. And that loyalty was cemented in the season one finale of, of Silicon Valley, where our main crew of characters uh, start working out, like, the mathematical equation to what it would take to give everybody in like the tech crunch showroom a hand job. That's, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was hilarious. And that, that was actually what like prompted his, you know, I guess opus there at the end when he was able to get the uh, Wiseman score. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I, and, and the thing about I, what I like about the show too, is they sometimes reveal like behind the scenes stuff. And so they revealed after the fact, maybe you saw this, that the math behind what they're talking about, I forget what it was like D D D like floor to F or D to F or something <laughs> dick to floor <laughs> ratio or something. They, they actually had like a mathematician, like work out it was like the mathematics of it. <laughs> this guy can jerk off four guys. We have to line up everybody by height because we need to be able to go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was funny. That was good stuff. Um, yeah, so Silicon Valley, I, I'm guessing that would be that would be part of your uh, your stable show yeah, too. And uh, I go ahead and throw Veep in there as well. Deep. Oh, Veep. Okay, yeah. Run the gambit on uh, on the HBO stuff right now. Nice. Uh, you could uh, you could do worse than to do that. Yeah. yeah. It's. I mean, they have a great lineup, man. They do. Getting better all the time too. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, uh, it's funny, like, I think, even though, again, I watch HBO, like, I think Game of Thrones is probably the main thing I watched over there. I've got Silicon Valley, too. Um, I, I've tried out Veep. I think I just need to put a little more time into it. I think I watched the first one or two episodes, and, uh, it's funny. I just, for whatever reason, it didn't hook me, and I, maybe I was just busy at the time. Um, yeah, I did the same thing, actually. Uh, I watched maybe half the first season, and it was probably last year, maybe the year before, before I caught up, and, uh. You know, now I'm watching the season. You know, as it's coming out, right? And uh, right. yeah, I'm a huge fan of the the writers of that show, and of course, uh, Julia. Gotta love her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gosh, is it? And again, I I don't mean to to just you know demean her down to her physical appearance, but my God, she looks hotter than she did on Seinfeld. Like, yeah. and she's 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 one of those rare people who's just is getting more attractive as she yeah. gets older. I think it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, heck, she just she had done last year, maybe two years ago. She did like the cover of Rolling Stone, like nude or whatever. Oh, really? Yeah, it was. I, I think they put like the Constitution kind of like on her back, but yeah, she was nude. Had a little butt crack mm-hmm. mixed in there. It was good stuff. Oh wow. <laughs> um, I see a couple it's... people referencing Eastbound and Down. I, I, it's a. Sh- I have to get on that show. I do. I've watched the first episode. I think everybody's watched the first episode because it has like that iconic opening. But I just, for whatever reason, I haven't gone beyond it. Um, you know, That's another great. show we were talking, I think you and I were talking offline about, uh, was it Vice Principals? Mm-hmm. I think I watched like four episodes of that and I really liked it. And we just, it, we just fell off of it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a question of loyalty or I was mad. I just think for whatever reason, we just didn't pick it back up and we need to. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that's got got gotten greenlit for a, a second season because they, they kind of leave it on a cliffhanger there at the end. It's a good, you know. It's funny. I haven't heard because even, even though I stopped watching it, like I still like I pay attention to TV mm-hmm. news and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. And I didn't hear if Vice Principals was renewed. I really hope so. Yeah, because I, I definitely want to pick it back mm-hmm. up again and 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 you know I'd like to see it continue. Walton Goggins, man. That's what yeah. I was going to say. I knew you were a fan of his. Yeah, I mean, I, we're I want I want to try and keep it like current tv for the moment but just mm-hmm. just talking broad for a second uh walton goggins if you know people don't know him from his role the, the role to me that really makes him was uh as shane vendrell on the shield mm-hmm. an amazing amazing show from fx kind of the first you know if if sopranos was sort of like the first golden era tv show of the modern the modern era mm-hmm. you know on in, on hbo the Shield was kind of like the first non-premium cable show that really kind of you know blew boundaries and and you know was just fantastic television. Um, and so Walton Goggins played a character on there, Shane Vendrell. If if you haven't seen it, definitely see that show. <laughs> really, really good. Um, but also another, he was also on a show you and I both like too, uh, Justified. Mm-hmm. He was got and if, and somehow he was even better on that show. Like I don't know how he did it. Yeah, great actor. Oh yeah, that, that guy. I mean, he shows up all the time in films too. You know, now looking back, now that I actually you know can recognize him, I'm like, oh wow, I didn't know he was in that. So uh, yeah, really talented guy. He pops up in a lot of things you don't remember him in. Because um, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. so, I'm, since I'm a big fan of uh, of riff tracks, I think I mentioned that on some oh, yeah. of the factory episodes. But um, one of the ones they do is uh, the Born Identity. And he's in that. Like I, you know, I was just watching it for riff tracks. I'd seen the movie before, but it had been years, and I, you know, I'm not really paying attention, whatever. And Walton Goggins is like one of the, you know, one of the CIA analysts that hangs out, you know, trying to catch Bourne in the room. And you know, he's he's kind of just a chameleon. He appears in lots of stuff. 
Well, I, I guess I can go ahead and uh, tell you this. Yeah, it uh, did get renewed for season two. Vice principals did. Vice principals did. So it's uh, no release date yet, but it is uh, set to. Yep, set to come out in uh, 2017 glad. at some point. Definitely, definitely glad to hear it. Isn't and and isn't Danny? You know. We've made the joke, I think, on the Sausage Factory, or at least we've made it privately offline, that we always somehow bring this stuff back to horror movies. And so, isn't Danny McBride uh, writing the new Halloween? Like he's he's like tied yeah. up doing the new Halloween, it's, or he's going to be doing yeah, the reboot or whatever. It's him and and someone else, I think, that are that are attached. Yeah, I forget I forget the name of the other dude. Um, it oddly like I actually have good vibes about that. I have this theory, and it comes off of something that uh, that Joss Whedon said once, where it was it was it was kind of I'm twisting something that's unrelated, but it is sort of related. It's how my mind works here, but um, that it's easier to take a comedic actor and have them do drama than it is to take a dramatic actor and have them do comedy. And I think um, that comedians and comedy writers, I think for whatever reason, I think they're just good at doing dark material. I mean, you look at what like Louis CK does on his show, which mm -hmm. is a very funny show, but can also be very, very dark, sometimes disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Jordan Peele, I mean, just, you know, kind of showed us with get out, which I still haven't seen yet. I think it's not on streaming. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to see it, but it just, again, just a few examples, but I think comedy guys, Whatever that thing is that makes them funny, maybe it's timing, maybe it's – I don't know. It's their gut, whatever. Um, I think it makes them good at horror. So all this is a roundabout way of saying I'm looking forward to what, what he turns out for Halloween. I think that could be good. Yeah. I mean I'm not going to you know dismiss it, but um, yeah, I'm open to, to it. it will, it'll be better than, than what someone else might put out, so – yeah, I think I think after what we saw from our friend Rob Zombie, that it could be it's the sky's the limit. There's there's nothing but up to go. Um, but anyway, to, <laughs> to bring to bring things back just a tiny bit, um, kind of the current stable of shows that I I have is I sort of have two tiers. I have kind of my premium level. I have to see them live, which right now is uh, Better Call Saul, um, Twin Peaks which just, just came out um, not this past weekend, the weekend before, but they released four episodes at once. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that in more depth here soon. Um, and also, um, why can't I? Oh, sorry. Um, Silicon Valley, which I already mentioned. Um, and I think right now everything else has kind of finished up. Oh, no, Fargo. I'm sorry. I'm a big fan of uh, Fargo on FX. Have you started um, the new season? Yes, yes. And so, I you know it's funny. I I was actually feeling a little down about the new season of Fargo. Um, it's not like seasons one and two of Fargo. Even though they're self-contained, you could sort of watch them independently, and you wouldn't really miss anything. They are linked. There's common characters, and there's kind of a like mm -hmm. season two is a prequel. That's actually something a character in season one mentions. I don't want to get any more specific if you haven't seen it, but very very good. Um, and season oh, yeah. three, not really part of that. It's kind of its own thing. And I wasn't digging the vibe right away, but now I'm, I'm really into it. Like it's, it's really good. And it's also cool. I'm a huge big Lebowski fan mm -hmm. and the, uh, it took me a couple episodes to figure it out, but like the, the villain, so to speak, you know, if you can define a villain on a show like that, uh, is, is Knox Harrington from the big Lebowski. I don't know whether you oh, wow. remember who that character was, but it, it's kind of weird to see him in this threatening like mob role when he played this kind of a feet giggling man in, in the big Lebowski. I'll look that up because I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, with the name. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. Not, yeah. Not, he was, uh, he was Julianne Moore's friend. He only appeared in one scene and he didn't really do much, but it's just this random scene. Uh, very funny. <laughs> in any case, those are those are my uh, those are my go tos right now, like top tier. And then second tier, everything else is kind of finished up. Like I'm a big fan of the CW, DC universe shows, uh, Arrow, The Flash, mm -hmm. Supergirl, um, even Legends of Tomorrow. Um, in fact, I, Legends of Tomorrow is like batshit crazy sometimes, but I, it's the most fun show to me. I don't know whether you watch any of those, but uh, you know they're they're I definitely don't. they're popcorn shows for sure, but. I, I enjoy them. They're they're a good fun time. 
Yeah, I, I just haven't given them a shot. I know uh, the Flash and uh, you know Arrow, people love that. So I probably need to get into it. It's just I don't know, man. I've just been burned out by superhero stuff. Yeah. Um, it's just been a little too much for me lately. <laughs> Even though that you know is like my bread and butter. Like if I was thirteen, I would be in you know heaven. <laughs> but I'm, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm a big fan of those shows, like that kind of <laughs> stuff. So I think it would take a lot to burn me out. Well, it's like I'm burned out by bad versions of it. So like, you know, when you get a movie like, you know, X-Men, The Last Stand, like that pisses me off. Like I want to like superhero stuff. So yeah. when I don't get good superhero stuff, it that that upsets me. Um, and I won't I won't say that the, the CW shows are, um, you know, like Emmy award winning <laughs> TV by any stretch. But um, I will say that like Arrow, if, if you if you need to like dip your toe in the pool, Arrow seasons one and two, I think, are pretty universally believed to be, like, really super good. Now, that's not to say that they, like, start sucking after that, but those first two seasons are really hardcore good. Like, they do some really cool stuff with that character. Um, and since Green Arrow isn't really a character that I think people have too many uh, hardened opinions about, like, mm -hmm. you know, people have certain opinions about what Superman is supposed to be, about what yeah, Batman right. is supposed to be, those kinds of things. Green Arrow, you know, hardcore comic book fans, nerds, whatever, I think they probably have a preconceived notion, but Green Arrow was largely, you know, I think they could kind of make them what they wanted to, and they did, and they did a great job with it. Um, and so those first two seasons, I think, really cement that. Uh, definitely worthwhile checking out, I think. Yeah, no, I've just got a lot on the docket. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going back checking out stuff I missed, you know, five, six years ago. And, right. You no, know, and... Yeah. It's just a lot of stuff, you know, it's basically what we're doing here is, is trying to find the, you know, the meat and potatoes of the, you know, of the uh, television experience and kind yeah, of try exactly to, right. you know, sum it up and you know, tell you what you can skip and tell you what to check out. Yeah. And it's, and it's a good point because, you know, part, part of what we want to do too is not only talk about what's good now, but what are some things you might've missed? And so like we already mm -hmm. mentioned the shield and um, you know, if, if you don't know, uh, the shield aired on FX, you know, you can, the DVDs are available, you know, you could probably buy their seasons through like iTunes and those kinds of places. Um, although I don't know that it may not be available. Um, but I, I do know that it's available on Hulu. Um, you can get all, all the seasons of the shield on Hulu and definitely worth it. So if, if you haven't seen that show, you, you take a look, it's really great. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff on Hulu. I just, um, it, it, Hulu is great. Like if you don't have cable and, if you want to watch current television, yeah. it's a really great, a great place to go. Yeah. I just, I don't know, man. It's really a balancing act trying to balance, you know, movies and just so much stuff to watch. And yeah, it's, it's just a lot. Well, that, that's kind of why I've, I've really limited it to, it's sort of like they're the shows I'll watch live, which again, that, that's better call Saul. That's Fargo. Mm -hmm. Although to be honest, I've missed Fargo a bunch of times this year and I just watched the next day. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, you know, I have a, I have a young daughter and you know, I, I think, I think you might have kids, but you know, whatever, if, if you have kids out there, you know how sometimes life draining that can be oh, man, but in a good DVR, way. The, though, good way. the DVR is a lifesaver. Absolutely. It's again, I, I, mean, I don't mean to demean parenthood at all. I'm just, it's tiring. You do a lot of stuff, you know, you can't always stay up till, you know, 11 to 12 o'clock watching TV. So, um, which is sad. That's used, that used to be me. I like, I, I used to have people like, how do you watch all this stuff? It's like, I'm, I'm yeah. focused. That's how, Exactly. but you just, you gotta make, you gotta, you gotta carve out time me. now. Yeah. yeah. It, it changes you. Now we're going to go into the, uh, the parenting, uh, show this is gonna be all about parenting from now <laughs> yes well see and that's kind of the thing too is when my daughter was younger she like she's now kind of more aware of things mm -hmm. like i can't it, like twin peaks like oh, yeah. a i need to pay attention to twin peaks i can't have her running around distracted like especially for that like i needed to be locked in mm -hmm. focused paying attention i didn't I didn't want her distracting me, but also there were some things in there that I think would have scared yeah. the shit out of her. So I don't want her having nightmares of, uh, you know, trees with lumpy heads sure. or anything like that. Well, that's a showtime show. So you, you don't know what's coming. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, and that's, you know, that's probably as good a, as good a segue as any, like kind of the, the biggest TV event of, I mean, gosh, certainly this year, but frankly, I think you could say in years, plural, 
has been the the return of Twin Peaks. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you uh, you you know the history. I don't know. Some of our viewers may may not know. Uh, you know, Twin Peaks aired in 1990 and 1991. Only had two seasons. And really, when you look at it, it's more like a season and a half because it was a it was kind of a mid season entry for its first season. Then its second season had a full like 22 episode order, and then uh, and then it got canceled. And then it had a uh, a year after that, it had a movie. Um, all this, all this directed by, um, sorry, created by David Lynch and Mark Frost. The movie written by David Lynch and um, and Bob Engels, but Mark Frost wasn't really involved in that. But but that was it. it. That that came out. It got canceled. Movie didn't do well at the time, and so Twin Peaks was was kind of done. But you know, the the second season of Twin Peaks ends on a pretty soul crushing cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of the uh, the hero, the the guy we've been rooting for for you know the whole season and a half. You know, we learn he's been uh, well. It, it, you know, now that we've had episodes, sort of hard to say, but at the time, it appears like he's been been possessed by an evil entity, kind of the the villain of the piece. Um, and and that was it. That was the end. So for twenty five years, Twin Peaks fans have wondered. <laughs> what happened? You know, is is he okay? What what happened to our to our hero? Um, and so, you know, two two Sundays ago, it it came back, and um, what Showtime did was kind of interesting. They had you know two two hour premiere live on the network, and then through the Showtime streaming app, if you wanted, you could also see the following uh, third and fourth parts. Um, and uh, see, I wasn't even aware they did that until after the fact. I was like, "Wait, they didn't show all all four? You know, because yeah. I, you know, I watched it on the app uh, later that, that that night. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. It, it's it's strange. Like, I think I think like hardcore fans and hardcore people paying attention probably knew that was the idea. But uh, but yeah, yeah. If you if you like again, if if you were just like a Showtime subscriber and you're not you're not all into apps and TV or whatever, you probably didn't even know. So episodes three and four did air live on terrestrial TV, uh, terrestrial TV. I'm sure I'm butchering that. Uh, this past Sunday. So at this point, all the episodes have aired in all the proper formats that you know everybody could have seen them now. Um, Man, and, that would uh, suck knowing those two episodes are out there, but you can't watch them. Yeah, you can't yeah. watch I I mean, gosh, I would. Yeah, that's why I, I mean, that's why I did it. I like, I, I sat down that night once, once we put my daughter in bed, mm -hmm. I mainlined all four episodes. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm a younger guy. I'm not, I haven't been waiting 25 years, you know, 27 <laughs> years, actually. I've been waiting 27 years, like some fans, um, you know, a, a buddy of mine over at uh, obnoxious and anonymous, and he's been on the sausage factory, Cameron, like he was a guy who watched twin peaks live. Like he has old VHS tapes, of the episodes, and so he has been waiting 27 years. Me, I'm a, a second generation, maybe third generation fan. I don't know how you categorize that, but I've only been waiting like 12 years, 12, 13 years. Um, I got on Twin Peaks in college and um, I fell in love with it. Like I was a big fan of Lost. I was a fan of Lost before I was a fan of Twin Peaks. I'd always heard of Twin Peaks, but you know, at the time, I, I learned later that there were like VHS tapes of the first season, but I didn't know that. So like at the time mm -hmm. that was when TV shows on DVD were starting to become popular. And that was ultimately how I did see twin peaks originally. Like Netflix wasn't doing its streaming thing then, but you know, I really had no way of watching it. And so I had a, had a professor in high in, um, in college who had a, a, a course about the modern TV drama. And we watched a lot of great shows. Um, but we spent like three weeks on twin peaks. And so we watched the pilot we watched oh, the episode that revealed Laura Palmer's killer. And then for the final week, we watched the final two episodes. Um, and we even watched David Lynch's failed, failed series after Twin Peaks called On the Air, which is one of the strangest things <laughs> you'll ever see. Definitely, yeah. definitely not peak TV. I don't recommend that. If, if you're interested enough, I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. But uh, So that, that was in between Twin Peaks and Firewalk With Me. Is that right? I think it was, yeah. I think it aired shortly after, like I. So tw you know, Twin Peaks ended that that uh, like the spring of 1991. I think on the air maybe came out that fall. I, geez, you know this this would be a Cameron could kind of come in and hit us with some dates here, but it, it, it wasn't long after Twin Peaks ended because David Lynch had a deal with ABC, so he he produced another series uh, as a part of that like producing deal, that licensing deal, whatever, um, and. 
the idea of it, the, the David Lynch sitcom was not something that viewers are interested in watching. Let's just, we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, I've never even heard of that before. Um, I, when you get a chance, maybe try and try and have your patience last for five <laughs> minutes. It is rough. It is really rough to me. And and I like David Lynch. You know, well, yeah. I think we'll talk about this here in just a second. I like David Lynch. I like his movies. I love Twin Peaks. I'm a huge fan of that stuff. So I, I have I definitely like and enjoy and have patience for the way David Lynch does stuff. You know, I think some people get upset with the way David Lynch will do like extra long shots where you can barely hear people or just really long extended scenes of people just like, mm -hmm. you know, doing doing laborious tasks. I think that stuff's funny. Like I enjoy it. Uh, others are not <laughs> are not so patient, and I, I respect it. Um, but on the air was an endurance trial I was not willing to uh, to to do. But um, you, know, you know, Twin Peaks getting canceled is really you know didn't they they switch the date that it that it, it they switched it to a Saturday night I think at one point. So and, uh, yeah, and I you know there's there's definitely great. Um, we can we can go yeah let's go over that briefly because so you know for for the uninitiated I, at this point I think there's been so much news about Twin Peaks I think you'd be have to be living under a rock to not yeah. <laughs> to not know some of this stuff but you know Twin Peaks aired and you know the the central the show was essentially like the if you could describe the plot succinctly it was who killed Laura Palmer uh, you know a young woman in this small town in in the Pacific Northwest was murdered. Um, and you know, she was the homecoming queen. Everybody loved her, and she was murdered. And it was who killed her. And so, you know, the police investigate, and they bring in an FBI agent from out of town. And that's kind of the that's kind of how the show starts. And you know, as you begin to peel back the mystery of who killed Laura Palmer, you learn a, you know, Laura Palmer was not just the you know the nice, pretty prom queen. She was into some dark dealings, and there were some dark things in her past and things she was into. Meanwhile, this this seemingly sleepy town of just nice happy people you know people are having affairs with everybody there's drugs there's violence there's just all this you know it, it was it was truly great interesting tv i mean it really kind of you know, challenged your preconceptions about small town america um and in season two of the show you know season one did not solve the laura palmer mystery um you know david lynch and mark frost the the creators you know, this has been this has been told again and again and again. Did not really want to solve the Laura Palmer mystery. To them, that was kind of the inception point. Like this is how we enter the town. This is this is what gets us there. That's the thing that drives the story. Who killed Laura Palmer? So if we solve that, like, well, what are we going to do? Um, I have my own sort of critical thoughts on that, um, and I, I've written as much on on a on my blog, uh, ericabruce.com, if, if you're ever interested in reading about that. But Regardless, they eventually did solve the Laura Palmer murder about nine episodes into season two of, of Twin Peaks. And mm -hmm. and the the common myth is that, oh, they solved the Laura Palmer mystery and the show got terrible and then it got canceled. That's not entirely accurate. You're you know, it like you were saying, the they solved the Laura Palmer mystery, but there were a few things that started happening in late 1990, early 1991. You know, A, the show had been losing ratings before the Laura Palmer mystery got solved. And the show got mm -hmm. moved to Saturdays of all places. So it used to be, I think, on Thursday nights, you know, one of the premiere shows on, on ABC, premiere shows on the network. But it gets moved to Saturday nights. Even back then, who the heck watches TV on Saturday nights? And, and even the people who do, they're not the audience of Twin Peaks. Um, and then, you know, the, the Gulf War happened. So yeah. it, it's not like the Gulf War really preempted Twin Peaks, I don't think. That might have happened once. But, you know, the show was already on rocky ground, and then it got, like, it got held. Like, they kind of, they didn't run the show for several weeks. And then when they did run it again, they ran, like, a bundle of episodes on one Saturday. And oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. and, those, and those didn't do very well. And so ABC, I think it was at that point, ABC like officially did cancel it, but they still had like six episodes left that they needed to air. And so, you know, they, they started burning episodes off later in the spring, but it was, it was never consistent. Like they would take weeks off. And then finally, when they had the two final episodes remaining, David Lynch came back to direct those and help rewrite some of that script. Um, 
you know, they were trying to save the series. And so they wrote into that final two hours, which were aired together as like a, a TV movie on ABC. They wrote in a bunch of cliffhangers. You know, the, the second season finale of Twin Peaks ends with, it's not, it's not just the, the cliffhanger I mentioned earlier, where kind of the hero of the show, you know, appears to be possessed and, you know, uh, captured by, you know, the demonic forces. Um, but, you know, several other characters are, you know, either, you know, broken and bleeding on the floor, blown up by a bomb. There's a, you know, poisonous spider dangling over one guy's head. There's just lots of crazy stuff happening. And their idea was, it's like, well, we'll just have all these cliffhangers. Gosh, the fans will clamor for it. ABC will have to give us a, you know, a resolution. And ABC said no. They were they were done with the Twin Peaks experiment. Um, it, yeah, it's... And you know, this is before the days when shows got ran multiple times, and yes. you know, before you could DVR or have on demand or any any of those options. And Twin Peaks is definitely a show you can't just start. You know, four right. seasons or four episodes down the road because right. it's very much plot driven, and you know, you, you can miss quite a bit in just you know one single episode. So them them doing that, I didn't realize that they didn't air it for for a few weeks. So, I mean, even if you are a fan of that show, you can't even really find it to watch. Right, right. And, I mean, that, that's kind of – I mean, I think you hit it on the head there is that this was an era where most TV shows – I say most because Twin Peaks was certainly not the first serialized show, but – it was it was odd in that it was serialized. It was certainly very strange. There was a lot of little details. There were mysteries that losing a week of Twin Peaks, like you would miss a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, you would lose the thread of the story in effect. Um, and they weren't doing reruns. iTunes wasn't a thing. You know, people didn't have DVRs. I mean, really, your only option was you had to record it. You know, you and and again, you know, my my buddy Cameron has uh, old VHS copies, but you know, you think about back then, you know, only hard diehards, really hardcore people would record TV shows like that. You know, the, the common viewer, even if they like Twin Peaks, weren't likely to do that. And so, you know, all the gaps, the changing schedule, it, I, I, I like to tell this because I think there, there's just this sort of myth out there that you know, Twin Peaks, the second season sucks. And that's why, you know, it got canceled. And, I, I challenge that. I actually think there's some really good episodes after they saw the Laura Palmer murder. Some of my favorites, in fact. Um, but I think it's just, it's, it's an interesting thing to see kind of like what happened to the show because, you know, in the first season, Twin Peaks just blew up. It was everywhere. Kind of like it is now. I mean, where you know, it was everywhere in pop culture. I mean, heck, the mm -hmm. whole cast appeared on Donahue. Who the hell remembers Donahue? <laughs> but there's a, uh, <laughs> there's, you know, you can watch it on YouTube. I think they've got the whole, uh, the whole thing. Oh, wow. But um, so so anyway, all, all of that context, you know, Twin Peaks was gone for 27 years. The, the, the entry point, though, in the final episode of Twin Peaks, David Lynch came back to direct and he did what David Lynch does. Like he took, you know, concepts on the page and just made them something special. And so the, the final episode of Twin Peaks contains about 20 minutes of until recently – what I thought to be some of the strangest stuff that you would see on TV, like surrealistic, weird, and terrifying. Um, you know, I remember the first time I watched it with my uh, now my wife, my girlfriend at the time. She like shot back into the couch at certain parts of the the finale of, of Twin Peaks. Um, it uh, it scary stuff as as only David Lynch can 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 bring it out. But there was a key line said by a character there. And I don't think they were doing this to set up what's happening now. I, I'm not sure why they did it, but um, a, a character says, I will see you again in 25 years. So as we've learned now, you know, in all the various interviews, Mark Frost and David Lynch got together a few years back and kind of decided, you know, there's still a fan base for this. People are still buying the DVDs. People ask us about it all the time. Maybe we can get back into this. And here's our way in. You know, we we said this 25 years ago, so maybe there's something we can do with that. Um, and so that's that's kind of where we are now. Um, and the the episodes that aired. Um, well, first off, David Lynch doesn't even refer to them as episodes. David Lynch filmed the 18 parts of the new Twin Peaks all as one. He filmed it like a movie, and then it was edited into parts. Uh, you know, again, we we can still call them episodes. You know, call them whatever you want. 
but um, he views them as parts, and um, they they are supposed to be telling kind of one continuous story over over eighteen parts. And um, two Sundays ago, the first two parts aired on Showtime, and then parts three and four were available for. Um, on-demand streaming and and by the way i actually think you could get them i don't think it was just the app like, i'm pretty sure your on-demand cable service had them as well oh really i think, that, I think that's a little catch too is i think if if you wanted to just go to your showtime on-demand list you know if you have xfinity mm-hmm. or, or files or whatever you have um i think those episodes three and four parts three and four were available there too um but you know, Jay, I think it, part part of why I'm interested to, to talk about this with you is is you know, as I've already said, like I'm a big, I'm a big Twin Peaks fan. I, I really do. I really like this stuff. I try to be objective. I try to view it with an analytical lens. But I, you know, it's I can't I can't lie. I'm a fanboy. I am. Um, <laughs> and so there there are certain things that. that I probably will, you know, not judge as harshly or have a strong opinion about because I really enjoy the subject material. Um, sorry, the subject matter. Um, and so I'm, you know, I've been filibustering here for a while. I very much like to get, get your view. I mean, we can, we can, we can do this a number of ways. We could talk about kind of each part unto itself. We can first kind of talk about, you know, what they <laughs> each were about. If there's any way of really describing that, sure. I would dare you to describe what part three was about. Um, or four. Or four. Um, but, uh, I, I really, I want to get your views. Cause I think, I mean, I think you represent more of the, uh, Kind of the average viewer, and I don't mean that in any derogatory sense. But sure. you know, you're not a Twin Peaks fan. I think yeah, no, anyway, I mean, I, you know, I've pretty much said that, you know, as much. But um, you know, I want to uh, use this as an opportunity to uh, plug your blog one more time. Oh, sure. Um, Thank you. What was the uh, the address again? EricABruce.com. And uh, that's just a WordPress site. Yeah. I read your article. It, uh, what was it called? I disagree with David Lynch. Um, like yeah, yeah, and just, just brief context. David Lynch is is kind of one of the people that picks on the latter half of season two. Like he was interviewed in the New York Times, and he said it's stupid and it's terrible, and mm-hmm. he he tries to distance himself from it. And I just took umbrage with that because David Lynch was like an executive producer. He created the show. He was mm-hmm. involved in the making of the show. Now he wasn't writing episodes. He wasn't directing them at that point, but he was involved. You know, he appeared in some of those episodes, mm-hmm. and and to me personally, I would have felt, I would have I would have been better if if he had said, you know what, we made some mistakes, we went down some narrative avenues we shouldn't have gone down. You know, it's you know some of it's not strong material, but you know I own that. I take mm-hmm. responsibility. I, I maybe mm-hmm. if I, if I didn't like it, maybe I should have been in more involved, or I should have said something or done something. But instead, he kind of passes it off like he was this uninvolved participant, and I just think it's dishonest, and also I, I think inaccurate. I like some of those episodes. I, I think it's a cop out because I yeah. mean, obviously, in uh, in uh, you know, Fire Walk with Me, I think you know Frost wasn't there, and you can kind of see the difference. You know, at least oh, yes. it, it seems apparent to me. I told you that I'd I, I'd walk I'd watch Fire Walk with Me three times in the past two weeks or so. You know, to prepare for Oof. this. God bless you. And, Jeez. Uh, yeah, I watched the whole first season, the whole second season, and Firewalk with me uh, twice, and then I've watched it again since. Right. But um, yeah, man, it's it, it's hard to put my finger on it, but you know, I do agree with a lot of your points in there, and I think one of my main criticisms of of uh, season two is just the the amount that's there. I, I think it's it's too many episodes or too many yeah. parts, however you want to call it. Yeah, it, it's just too much material. I think they could have really edited that down to a lot more cohesive story, and it it, it would have been a lot better. You know, I don't have a problem with the uh, what's the character's name, Wyndham. Uh, Wyndham Earl. Yeah, Wyndham Earl. Um, you know, I don't sort have a problem with the back half of the show. Yeah, with that, with that plot line at all. I think it's uh, really interesting and you know really creepy. A lot of yeah. elements of that, and you know, if uh, you know Cooper's past with him and all that. Um, you know, I really enjoyed that. Uh, right. It, it just, it seemed like it was too much. And, and I can kind of see how it went from what, eight episodes in the first season, something like that. Yeah. See, and that's, and that's exactly right. I mean, that's, exactly that's a right. big jump. So I don't and, know, maybe they could have fleshed that storyline out over maybe three seasons. That may have been a little better. Right. And, and what happened too, is that David Lynch and Mark Frost largely built the whole first season. They did not mm-hmm. write and direct every single episode of season one. Although David Lynch, you know, he directed the pilot, he directed episode uh, part three, episode three. We can call seasons one of two and Twin Peaks episodes without 
Any any problem? <laughs> it's it's the new series that I think defies oh, okay. episode. Okay. But you know, again, call it not what you want to call it. Um, the first season, those eight those eight parts, eight episodes, whatever they were kind of all thought through and the, the the bones, the narrative structure was built out. And so other people wrote other episodes, but those seem so strong because really everybody was swimming in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Season two ran more like a TV show of the time. And so I, I a hundred percent agree with you. Like twin peaks was a show of 2017 trying to be done in 1990. And so, you know, it, it was trying to take this wild creature and put it in this box that really couldn't couldn't hold it. You're, I mean, you're exactly mm-hmm. right. like, but the, if you think about it back then, you, you had, you know, sitcoms were 22. I mean, gosh, I think oh, sitcoms man. back then were like 24 or 20. Entirely too and, many. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think even dramas were like 22 episodes, 24 episodes a season. Like, you know, you just go back to like 1993. I'm pretty sure the first epi- first season of The X-Files has 25 or 26 episodes. Mm-hmm. I mean, holy cow. I feel bad. Like, gosh, you know, actors complain about the 13 episode seasons they have now. Try, imagine trying to do 25 episodes of an hour long series, particularly like the X-Files, yeah. which I think is a good analog to Twin Peaks. Cause you know, it's, you know, kind of genre type writing, you know, there's some special effects, there's, you know, weird things going on. Mm-hmm. It's, it's taxing, I'm sure, but you're a hundred percent right. That, that is probably what, you know, that, that did not serve the second season of the show well. Well, I feel that way about a lot of shows. That's that's why I like the, uh, you know, maybe the uh, the BBC style of, of, of uh, television. Maybe yeah. do eight to ten episodes in a, in a series yeah. and you know, maybe do three three series and call it quits. You know, yeah. that's because, you know, shows now, if they're popular at all, they're going to run until they're no good anymore, generally. Right. Well, and even you know, past their prime. Yeah. Um, Stranger Things. Stranger Things was what seven episodes, eight episodes, something. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't the typical thirteen. It was much shorter, mm-hmm. and I think all the stronger for it. I think it was very, very good. It's just too popular for them not to do more, right? Right, right. Um, That's it's a shame. it's you know, and I, I think that they're finally wising up to it. Though at least Netflix is. I think Netflix because Netflix is trying to break the mold, trying to do their own thing. Um, the Defenders which is the kind of the the Netflix TV series version of the Avengers for the, the Marvel shows that are on Netflix, oh. Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and uh, ugh, Iron Fist. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen Iron Fist yet. I've, I've, I've you, heard bad things. You just yeah. go ahead and take your time on that. You don't need to rush to yeah. see that. Um, big fan of the, the others, though. Yes, absolutely. The, the Defenders, though, the, the big team-up show that's going to have all of them, which debuts in August, Um is only going to be like eight episodes, seven or eight episodes, if I'm not mistaken. Whereas the ser- the individual shows have all been kind of a traditional, I think, uh, 13. And I like that. I, I like that they've sort of said, we have a story. It will take us this many segments to tell the story. And that's it. You don't try and like, well, but you need to have five more episodes. Five more episodes of what? We don't have story for that. Or they just, you know, we'll see Iron Fist and Luke Cage going out to get coffee. You know, that's, I mean, that's what you'll have when you do that. Or to bring it back to Twin Peaks, you'll have the, you know, goofy deputy Andy and and clothing store salesman Dick Tremaine, you know, yeah, dealing with that. some kid <laughs> who may or may not be like a, yeah. a murderer or something. You know, some stupid plot line like that. It's that's exactly uh, it's, the kind of stuff I was always thinking about. Right. Um, or, you know, James, again, my, my favorite is, uh, James and Evelyn. James was a character already that kind of taxed my patience, the kind of emo biker sensitive type. Mm-hmm. And then you just spin him off into this story outside of the town with no one else that we know, like a bunch of hammy melodramatic <laughs> actors. You got to wonder what yeah. they were, what they were thinking on some of that. I, again, I'm not... I'm not a I'm not a Twin Peaks apologist. I'll say that I, I definitely like it. And again, I even get some joy out of some of the hammy stories yeah. of season two. But um, yeah, suffice to say, I think you're I think you're spot on. But um, in any, I'm sorry. But again, to, to bring it back, um, you know, what were your what was your opinion of um, of the of the the new episodes, the new the new parts of of Twin Peaks? Yeah, uh, you know, it, I think it's really just gearing up. Especially, you know, it's going to be what 18 episodes. You said. Right. Uh, it's you know I really like three and four more than one and two. Um, I don't really know why that is, but um, it's one especially just seems like it's all over the place. I know it's trying to set this up, but it's you right. know, 
as a standalone thing, it's kind of hard to, you know, because you don't really get a lot of Twin Peaks and I think the, maybe the first two. Right. Um, it's, um, let's see, uh, you know, the whole thing with the box, you know, the guy who's watching the, uh, the box in the room is recording right. it. Um, uh, and you know, the, the young lady comes in, which uh, a lot of that in the first episode is what they showed in the, uh, the, the trailers. Yeah. For the show. Which I was glad about that. Really, by the way. Yeah. It's, it doesn't really reveal much at all because that, you know, that, that character there, him and the, uh, the girl weren't there very long at all, which she was in, um, uh, California. I was, was going to bring she that up. She was also yeah. the little girl on the nanny from the nineties with Fran. Dresser. Really? Wow. Yeah, she's she was the, young, the youngest which, one, huh? which, which puts her in a whole new light, doesn't it? Wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Unfortunate. But yeah, I was going to bring up that, you know, they didn't, they didn't waste much time, uh, with their ability to show, uh, you know, nudity, things they couldn't show on network television. Yeah. It was, what, maybe five minutes in, and uh, she's already already completely nude. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's uh, – and I, I've really got a problem with the CGI. I know I know Cameron is, says he's okay with it, but uh, it just it really bothers me a lot. Well, what, what's uh, an example? Cause, cause, know, again, I, there's get, several CGI sequences I know, but like what, what stands out to you as being a, like a, you know, a well, gross kind of problem, you know, when she, when Laura takes her face off to begin with, and yeah. it's uh, the bright lights under there, um, that, uh, when the, uh, you know, they're watching the box and they're, you know, about to have sex and it kills them both. Uh, yeah. that's really odd. My, my biggest problem with the whole thing is when they found the lady dead, uh, you know, that uh, Matthew Lillard was yeah. accused of killing. Does that not look really weird to you? The dead, her dead body looked, it, it looked like a matte painting or something almost. It did look strange, but I didn't think there was any computer effect. I mean, again, there, there's always it, it, probably some kind of digital touchups or whatever, yeah. but I, I don't think that was a digital effect. I mean, I really? think it was just okay. makeup and some kind of a, you know, a just, mannequin or dead body, whatever they've got. I mean, the the lighting, and I'm just assuming this is fi- this is filmed on digital. It just gives it, it a whole different look to me right. that I don't like. Um, you know, I can look past it, but it just a lot of that stuff really bothered me. Right. Um, you know, just straight out of the gate. Um, the only reason I give it a pass, and again, my my opinion is tainted. I've already revealed my bias, but the only reason I give it a pass is that the kind of the graphics in the original Twin Peaks were sort of knowingly hokey sometimes too. And I'm specifically right, right. thinking of like the final sequence in the Black Lodge from the season two finale. The thing that jumps out to me as being a very hokey effect, but an effective one was when uh, the character Bob basically takes the soul of Wyndham Merle. And it's this sort of reverse film, like reverse explosion getting like sucked down. Like it is this very odd effect, but I thought somehow it looked so odd and cheap that it it was strangely like disconcerting. And that's kind of how I felt about the CGI here where, you know, the, the example, Laura taking off her face, like it certainly did look like CG, but to me, it just, it seemed part and parcel to that same kind of hokey, graphical kind of approach it, it it felt of a kind as with the original series i guess is what i'm saying um it, it, that's why it didn't bother me too much well you know the effects in the original i felt like you know as hokey as they were it it, it added to the charm of the show right it's very unique uh the, you right. know the way it looked and and i really enjoyed it and it's just it doesn't feel the same i have a problem with cgi anyway it's that's just me yeah. personally but no, you're um, not you're definitely not alone in that it just it, uh, it 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 feels like it takes the personality out of the you know it's, it's hard to interact with something that's not there you know and that's as, true. you know as cheesy as that you know monster may look you know at least it's actually there and it's you know physical and you can touch it but you know the second you put a you know a green tennis ball that you're afraid of it's yeah you know, it, it kind of takes some of it out you know at least for me personally I've often thought that like miniaturized stop motion looks so odd as to be kind of frightening. Like to mm-hmm. like, you know, you, you think of uh, like Ed 209 in RoboCop, mm-hmm. you know, some, some shots of Ed 209 are like a legitimate 
you know, real mm-hmm. size thing. But when you see them walking, sometimes it's got this, you know, again, because it's not quite right. Yeah. But to me, that's effect like that. I don't want to call it cheapness because they didn't, you know, they weren't trying to be cheap, but that effect, that sort of Harry Housen kind of, uh, mm-hmm. Harry, you know, Harry Housen, whatever effect, um, is is good and so i like that i kind of like and so i i agree like cg is not often well done less is more i think that's why chris nolan is like a good movie director because he doesn't i find he doesn't like overdo cg and he uses it in intelligent ways Mm -hmm. i think that's the key really to getting it right is you can't you know depend solely on on cg it needs to have some sort of practical element behind it right use it you know as a you know to supplement the practical right. effect, but right. um, but you know, from the story. That, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> as you know, as cheesy as the you know the effects are in like RoboCop stop motion stuff, you know I can appreciate that. But I think it's a generational thing. I think kids yeah. that grew up with some of the computer stuff, you know, even as bad as it is, I mean, you, I mean, like go watch something from the early two thousands that has a lot of that in there. Oh, it just God. it looks terrible, you know, and and. It it ruins a lot of things for me, and you know I wish it didn't bother me as much as it does because just about everything is that way. But well, it was you know it's it's cheap, and in the early two thousands, like everybody had access to it. Yeah. So like every movie has it in some way, and it always you, you can you can sort of like pick a movie out of that time period because you know they're all trying to use this sort of cheapo cgi effect for things that they probably could have done you know um, uh, something that stands out to me is freddy vs jason mm-hmm. there's a there's a there's there's cg in that movie and there's one particular scene where it's like a, a guy is like walking towards the camera and then his body needs to bend in an odd way and they just they use cg and and i i, I have a visceral reaction to it on top of that because i watched like the special features on the the dvd for it and it's sort of disheartening to hear them talk about it. It's like, yeah, so we tried this visual effect and it wasn't quite working. And then we tried this other thing. So then we just used CG. It sounded like it was just like an easy out. Yeah. Like, ah, so then we just did some CG and that worked fine. Like it, ju- it just sounded like a real cop out, like a real lazy thing. Like, like ah, we just used it. Yeah. I, and that like, and so whenever I see that, even to this day, like it bugs me. Cause you know, I, I, again, I, I like it. Freddy vs. Jason. Generally, it's you know hokey movie, but uh, oh, yeah, really, okay. Out of it. Well, I, I mean, come on, it's it is what it is. I enjoy the movie, but it's not. Uh, you know, if I were to pick like you know my favorites of the franchise, that one would not be near the top of the list. I mean, okay. Fri- yeah. Friday Four, uh, Nightmare Three, Night. Wait, I mean Nightmare One, of course. Nightmare Three, even New Nightmare, I think, is really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Freddy vs. Jason is fun. It's a good popcorn movie. They all are, but I mean, you know what I mean. True. Um, I mean, hell, I'd put Friday the Thirteenth Part Five over Freddy vs. Jason. I have more fun watching that movie. Yeah, yeah. Friday Five is one that, that, that people do champion. Yeah. Um, but anyway, what? <laughs> getting back to Twin Peaks again. We always turn it to uh, horror yeah, movies. Halloween. Exactly. Friday, always. Um, what did you think about the uh, like? So, from a story perspective, though, on Twin Peaks, what you know, what's what story there is to this point? Because again, we're definitely yeah. seeing just the we're sort of still table setting. But what did, what did you? Uh, what was your reaction to that stuff? Oh man, uh, you know, I like uh, I like seeing Cooper again, or at least you know, Kyle McLaughlin. Um, I yeah. don't know if, if we've actually seen the real Cooper yet, but uh, in the lodge we have. Was that, like that was that, that him? That, okay. Yeah, so like in in the Black Lodge, I mean, you're seeing our Cooper, you know, of of sound mind and body. It's just that you know he's sort of interacting with this backwards talking weirdo CG world. Uh, so he's not kind of the you know he's not like drinking coffee and eating cherry pie just yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I really like like the way he plays that character. But um, you know what are we going to call these guys? We got doppelganger one and doppelganger two. Because who's the guy that's in the prison? That's is that that's not really Cooper, right? So yeah, there's so there's there's th- Kyle McLaughlin is <laughs> to date. I don't know whether there'll be more, but to date, Kyle McLaughlin has pa- played uh, three characters now on this new version of Twin Peaks. He has mm-hmm. played Special Agent Dale Cooper, who we all know and love. Mm-hmm. He has played doppelganger Cooper. So 
at the end of Twin Peaks season two, when we see that, that Cooper has been possessed by the, the demon entity, Bob, there was a little bit more going on there. And I was actually having this debate with, with Cameron. We're still trying to figure out what is the nature of the doppelganger. Yeah. We don't need to get into those details here necessarily, but it, think of him as literally like the mirror universe, you know, uh, goatee wearing version of agent Cooper. He's the evil Cooper. Um, from the Black Lodge. <laughs> yeah. So he, whereas our Cooper wears a suit and a tie and he's all very trim and proper and his hair nicely quaffed, Dark Cooper, Doppelganger Cooper, whichever name you gravitate to, has long kind of greasy hair. He looks sort of tan. His skin's kind of, uh, you know, edgy. And he doesn't say very much and he's violent and he's, you know, pretty terrible guy mm -hmm. and then there's a third version of cooper who we meet briefly um a guy named uh dougie jones who uh is overweight he's got a nice quaff of hair on his head <laughs> made possible by a very funny wig where or uh by kyle mclaughlin and um wears awful awful colored suits he appears to be a realtor um, okay and the the nature of dougie jones is unclear it, uh, but but he is um yeah there's so there's three versions so there's there's Agent Cooper there's Dale there's Dougie Jones and there's like Dark Cooper doppelganger but, uh, Cooper okay okay uh, quick question okay yeah so Dougie Jones um he goes away when he's in there with the uh, prostitute right yeah and, and uh the who who comes in his place what are we gonna call him. Well, that's and see, and that's a fair question. So, the body, it, I mean, it is Dale, like Agent Dale Cooper from the Black Lodge escapes. So, you know, spo spoiler alert: if you haven't right. seen the new episodes, we are kind of spoiling this. We're, we're going to get into these kinds of things on this. Oh, show, yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, Cooper, after twenty-five years, finally does escape the Black Lodge. He, he we could talk a little bit about this. He does it in a very, very odd fashion, but he does basically. From what from what the, sh the the show has shown us, what what apparently is happening is that the doppelganger of Cooper can only be out of the Black Lodge for twenty five years. I don't know why that's a rule, but apparently it is. However, he knows this, so he has done something, and this is what's unclear. There's this other guy, Dougie Jones, and it's unclear whether he was just a guy living in the world that doppelganger Cooper found and planned to like substitute him in his place. But the Black Lodge is trying to pull Dark Cooper back in so that our Dale Cooper can come out. The doppelganger either somehow created this man, how he would do that, I don't know, but that's, you know, there, there's a line of dialogue that says, you know, you've been manufactured. Right. I, I'm not sure if that literally means he's been created by the doppelganger, but regardless, there's this other guy. And so basically what was supposed to happen is doppelganger Cooper was supposed to get pulled back into the Black Lodge and our Cooper, Special Agent Cooper, was supposed to come out and, and replace him. Mm -hmm. that they were supposed to swap. But doppelganger Cooper somehow found a way to trick, to trick that so that our Cooper replaced Dougie Jones instead. But because things didn't work out the way they were supposed to, and this is, I think, the crux of your question, our Dale Cooper isn't quite right. He's sort of like a Dale Cooper with his mind wiped. He kind of he acts like a child, like he okay. barely okay. barely speaks. So he, that is uh, the real Cooper. Okay, that is so, the real so that's that 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 was my problem. Oh, okay, okay. I got you. Yeah, I, you. I mean, well, and again, this is just this is my person. I, I think, and I, I think I'm on solid ground here, man. Sure. I, I believe that's our Cooper, but the process of coming out of the Black Lodge because Doppelganger Cooper somehow threw a wrench into the works there. I, I think had things worked out the way they were supposed to, he would have come out and been fine. He would have just been Special Agent Dale Cooper, drinking coffee, eating pie, you know, doing lots of fun stuff. But because the, the process was sublimated, he's not right. And so our Agent Cooper now doesn't really – he doesn't appear to have memories. He doesn't appear to be, I mean, he, you know, people have to kind of walk him around and show him things. Like he doesn't really understand anything, which actually leads to, I think some pretty funny comedic that, moments. Like Kyle favorite, McLaughlin is selling the whole it thing so far, man. It's, yeah. It's, I love it. I mean, Kyle Mr. McLaughlin Jack is, Pops, I love it. Mr. Jackpots. <laughs> um, 
Kyle McLaughlin to me, just in the first four parts alone, to say nothing of what he's going to do after, you know, after these four parts, uh, you know, part five airs this coming weekend. I can't wait. Um, I, I think he's already earned his Emmy. I mean, he's playing three different roles. He's playing technically three different characters, but then one character, you know, for all intents and purposes, has appeared, you know, suffered a stroke, basically. So he, he's really playing like four, ver- yeah, four. four versions of a character and just blowing them all out of the park, I think. Um, so he, I, I hope he gets some Emmy love when that time of year comes around. <laughs> but, no, uh, that's but, yeah, what I was going to say. That's my favorite parts, man. It's, I love the, uh, he just he nails the comedic timing, but uh, I don't know. I, you know. I'm a big fan of Kyle McLaughlin anyway. I don't know if you uh, you watch Portlandia at all. I've seen I've seen him on Portland. I don't like follow that show religiously, but the mm-hmm. episodes I have seen have featured the mayor character. See, I've you know I've been watching Portlandia since like season one, season two, and um, yeah. I feel like this Twin Peaks talk has been going on for a little while. You know, like. At least the past four or five years, I've you know I've been hearing, you know, little uh, mutterings about it here and there. Well, it was well, so it was the summer of 2014 that the series was released on Blu-ray, and oh, okay. beyond that, it also featured. Actually, here's a question because you said you just watched Fire Walk with me. Did you watch the missing pieces? That's what I need to see. I was gonna yeah. Okay. I did forget to say that. Yeah, I have not seen that yet. So that that was kind of the big deal in the summer of 2014, where they released the original two seasons on on Blu-ray. So you know, high def, all prettied up, really great set. Um, but it also, for the first time, included the movie Fire Walk with Me with it. And mm-hmm. on top of that, for years and years and years, there has been you know a script online for Fire Walk with Me that features it, it's you know it's like god it's like 400 pages long it's really long and it features all these scenes that you don't see in the movie and there was all these rumors for years that there's all these deleted scenes that were filmed and were never released and and whatever and so the missing pieces are basically david lynch went back and he himself uh you know I mean, i'm sure he worked with some editors too but like he personally went in and like stitch together all of the deleted scenes from fire walk with me into kind of a, a series of vignettes and they're, you know, some are good, some are, you know, you can understand why they were cut, but you know, at the time that was the first quote unquote new twin peaks content fans had gotten in, you know, 24 years. So everybody was going crazy. There was a lot of talk about that, but it was in that following October that it was revealed that Twin Peaks was coming back. And at the time they said for nine episodes on Showtime, things, you know, morphed and changed since then. But, um, so yeah, you've definitely, I mean, you've been hearing about Twin Peaks for at least the last three years or so just from that stuff. Well, yeah, I remember when there was, uh, I believe creative differences between David Lynch and Showtime when it was a period of time when it wasn't going to happen at all. And all of a sudden yeah. it was back on. I don't know. It was a, a budget a dispute or something like that. My understanding, based on what they've said, is they, again, in that initial kind of release, they said, you know, we're coming back for nine episodes. And once Showtime agreed to that, Mark Frost and David Lynch went away and started writing it. Mm. What they what they ultimately wrote and created, they went back to Showtime and were kind of like, you know, what we made to really do this, we need more than nine episodes. We need more money. We need, you know, to do this right, this is what we need. And... I think Showtime, it, you know, the way David Nivens, the uh, kind of the, the, the chief guy over there at, at Showtime says, you know, he was out of the country at the time. And for some reason, he got like cut out of it initially. You know, if he'd been there, things would have been fine. But, um, you know, I think Showtime initially was like, no, you know, we we said we were doing this for this. And now it's like, you want to double what you said? Um, and so David Lynch was like, you know what? I if you want me to do this, I'm going to do it the way it has to be done. And so I was like, okay, I'll see you. Good, good luck. You know, you have a script, you know, have fun making it. And, you know, it took about a month or so. Like, again, all, all this time, by the way, just so everybody knows, like I was having a heart attack. And this, so I, I, right. I literally remember like my stomach falling out of me the day I read that. I was like, oh my God, mm-hmm. to think it's coming back to have it ripped away like this. And also too, it's like David Lynch is an old guy. Like I fear he's going to drop dead at any moment. He still yeah. smokes like a chimney. Um, Does he? Oh, wow. That's not <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, they after about a month or so, they worked it out. And there was even some rumors, too, that there were issues where, as part of the money discussion, people he wanted to bring back, like Showtime wasn't really willing to pay them what 
what they wanted, what he wanted them to have. Because um, I think at the time, there were some, like, Sherilyn Fenn was doing some odd tweeting, kind of making comments about Hollywood, and it all seemed to be tied into this whole thing. Um, but again, it all got worked out, and, and here we are. Uh, She's not in the show at all, is she? So, yeah, so Sherilyn Fenn, who played Audrey Horn on the original series, is in the new show. She was in the cast list that was released, but she has not so far appeared in the four parts okay. that we've seen. Um, yeah, so far we have only seen from the original cast, uh, you know, Dale Cooper, of course, um, yeah, Deputy Andy, Lucy. Um, we've seen Bobby Briggs. We have seen, uh, um, oh, God, Shelley. I feel like we're, oh, we've seen Dr. Jacoby. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've also seen Ben Horn and his brother Jerry Horn, but there's still some people. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed Hawk. We've seen Hawk. We've even seen the Log Lady, which, which by the way, I thought, yeah. um, you know, Ka Catherine Catherine Coulson, who, who plays the role of the Log Lady on the original show, um, you know, she was very very ill at the time they were filming, um, and so that that's pretty much in the show. You know, in, in her scenes in the show, she looks. Um, she looks ill and it doesn't, it's not makeup. You know, you could tell they, yeah. they were kind of filming around her real life difficulties. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite frankly sad. I think it gives her scene scenes extra weight that they probably wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was surprised when I saw her in there, you know, I, I, I didn't expect her to be able to, you know, I knew she passed away. I mean, was it even in 2017 or was it, uh, maybe no, it was back in, it was back in 20. I mean, I think it was like in 2015, 2016. I know she she died at a point when like I didn't even think filming had begun. Yeah. And so I I didn't think she was going to be in it at all. Like I'm I'm gratified that she's able to make an appearance. But oh wow, um, you're right. It was in 2015. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because fil filming started then and went into 2016. Like they were filming for a while. I mean, heck, I think David Lynch was filming as recently as April. Like he was still doing something in April. <clears throat> wow. What that is, really... of course, we won't know, but. Um, they really spent a lot of time on the show. And and what's interesting though is that so uh, David Bowie, who plays a character in Fire Walk with Me, which <laughs> if you've only seen the theatrical version of Fire Walk with Me, you know David Bowie's in it, but you can't make a whole lot of sense about it. If you see the missing pieces, there's more to his character there. You mm -hmm. can get a little more out of it. Um, I see that. So you know, fans were kind of wondering, gosh, can we get David Bowie in this? Um, and then David Bowie died, but he died after they started filming, and so. It was noted that he didn't film anything for the show, but I got to be honest. I take everything I hear about that with a grain of salt because I think David Lynch is trying to keep everything, you know, buttoned up, secret. I think he released the cast list like with everybody who with a speaking role, but I'm not sure how literal I, I am to take that list. Like I, I think there's probably people that are in the show that weren't in that list because he's trying to preserve the surprise. That 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 would be very impressive. Right. Um, and, and by the way, that's just something um, that I think, you know, is to be commended about the new show that, you know, this wasn't this wasn't like, you know, the movies and TV shows that we have now where you pretty much know what you're about to watch, you know, before it's on. You know, you've seen trailers, you've seen commercials, you see the whole damn episode before it's out. Um, I, I very much liked that. I sat down to watch this and I had no idea what I was going to get. And I was largely happy with it. And so, you know, and the thing that that I thought shocked me, too, was that it literally did kind of to orient you start with a flashback to that scene from the season two finale where Laura says, um, you know, I'll see you again in 25 years. And it was sort of like the show kind of saying, here's our way in. Now, let's, you know, let's show you 25 years later. Um, as a, you know, as a Twin Peaks fan, I've been enjoying it. You know, I, I've seen some people, it, it's not, you know, it's not like the, you, you've, you've said this, you know, it's not like the original series. It's absolutely not. It's probably closer in tone to fire walk with me, but I actually think it's, it's a lot more coherent. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, I, I never expected it to be like the original series. Like I knew it was going to be something else. What it was going to be, I didn't know. So, from that perspective, like I, I didn't come on with preconceived notions because frankly, I had no idea what they were going to give me in the first place. Um, there's been a few things on the show. If I have like a major complaint, it would probably be the lack of music. 
because and I don't even just mean like the various Twin Peaks themes that you know, like Laura's theme, which does appear, um, and some other things, but like just generally a score. It's it's largely moody synthesizer ish <laughs> music. Um, but then again, you know, here in 2017, you know, think about the, the most popular shows. A lot of them don't have scores. So, you know, Twin Peaks, when it aired, was kind of taking elements of the series at the time, like cop dramas and soap operas, and sort of making something different with them. I, I think, you know, this is just sort of Twin Peaks brought into the modern world doing the same thing. I mean, you think about... Um, you know, think about Breaking Bad. Like, there's music in Breaking Bad. There certainly is, but it's not all the time. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's music in Fargo, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more kind of moody type stuff. And so I think, you know, I, I can complain about it, but I'm I'm largely digging it. And frankly, I think what they're trying to do is like, as we get closer to Twin Peaks, like things start to be set more and more in the town. I think that old score is going to start surfacing more and more and more. Um, and so I think it's being used almost as a narrative device, as kind of an emotional tug on uh, on, on what on the proceedings. But yeah, um, that's a good point. I've been yeah, watching I, with the uh, with the closed captioning on, and uh, it says like atmospheric music yeah. or otherworldly music or something. Yeah. Or noises. You know, it's. <laughs> yeah, I watched. It, it the doesn't have a way to describe it. I watched the like my first watch through was without closed captioning, but for my subsequent watch throughs, mm -hmm. yes, I put this because there were a number of things like, I wasn't sure I heard it right. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, it just and especially with David Lynch, sometimes he's intentionally like garbling dialogue, mm -hmm. and there's even things that I missed. Like um, uh, oh, and I didn't mention you know David Lynch appears in Twin Peaks. He he, he plays a character. He's a uh, special. He's the Agent Cooper's boss, uh, Gordon Cole. A uh, uh, basically a guy with hearing aids who yells a lot, um, and then uh, Miguel Ferrer who passed away too, yeah, I was gonna but, but did, too. did finish his scenes. He also appears yeah. as uh, the iconic character Albert Rosenfield, uh, kind of the medical examiner of the FBI. Um, he, um, hmm. but uh, in the scene where they kind of encounter Doppelganger Cooper, they don't know this, of course. Um, <laughs> clearly, they sort of suspect something's wrong, but uh, you know. That that scene, I thought, um, you know, kind of benefited from the that that approach. Um, yeah, that that Cooper, he uh, whatever you want to call whatever that character is, he uh, his voice was really deep for one thing right. that threw it off. But he knew things like he acted like he knew um, a, a deputy. Uh, uh, well, like, he knew Gordon, like he knew yeah, Gordon, Gordon Albert. Right. Yeah, yeah. Gordon. Yeah. And you know, he, he knew things about, you know, their, their relationship. Well, that's see, and that's why like my conception of the doppelganger is that he is literally just a dark version of the Dale Cooper. We know. So he knows everything that Dale knows. Mm, and okay. you know, he's now, you know, he knows 25 years worth more of stuff. Cause he's been out in the world, you know, causing havoc you know, whatever, beating up hillbillies and old shacks in the woods. But, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's why I think he knows them. Like, I don't, like, that, that's my conception of the character, that it is literally Dale Cooper, but just like an evil version, you know? I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. the simplest way I can put it. Um, but it, the thing I missed is that I think when he first is talking to Gordon, I just thought he said it's, you know, it is very, very good to see you again, old friend. Apparently, his first very, he says backwards. So he says, like, you're a very good to see you again. <laughs> and it's a detail that I missed. Yeah. And, you know, some people are just, you know, noting that, hey, this is like, you know, it's a sign that, that the character is kind of reverting to, you know, in the, in the Black Lodge, everybody talks with that kind of reverse speak. Um, and so it's just, it's an interesting detail that I didn't catch and I wouldn't have I caught either. it had it not been for the closed captioning and for other people, uh, you know, pointing it out online. Yeah. I've, I've seen it, uh, I believe just twice that, that episode, but, um, yeah, yeah I missed that too. That, uh, it does make sense. Yeah. But, um, the, the thing we talked about a little bit earlier is that, um, you know, Dale eventually does make it out of the black lodge, but he's not himself, but his, his way of getting out of the black lodge 
is easily some of the most challenging TV you will ever watch in your life. I I, made, I commented that you know the twenty minutes of like the finale of of Twin Peaks season two was some of the strangest TV you'll ever see. Well, here twenty seven years later is Twin Peaks to top themselves in that regard because it, I mean this is some of the most surrealistic, odd confusing imagery I, you know it's funny i think when you watch it the first time it's very odd and confusing i think on subsequent rewatches even though it still is very odd and confusing mm -hmm. there is kind of a logical linear flow like you well, you you get what's happening even though it makes no sense right so this is when he he, he his shoes come off right he gets sucked into the uh right so let's <laughs> so you know, uh, Dale Cooper is, is told he can leave the Black Lodge. He's, I, I want to just say this out loud because it really sounds ludicrous to say. So Dale, Dale Cooper is told he can leave the Black Lodge. But then he is told he can only leave when his doppelganger comes back. Like they have to swap, basically. So he's walking around. And then he encounters a character from the original Twin Peaks. The, the, the short, the little man, the dancing dwarf. Right. Who is now portrayed by a CG tree yeah. with like a talking lump of flesh for a head. Um, it's, and he's the evolution of that, that character, I guess. Um, I believe that was done because the, the actor who originally portrayed him was not happy with his compensation that Showtime was going to give him. And so he started saying David Lynch, like was a murderer and raped his own daughter and really horrible things out in public. So uh, he's, he's out of it. Um, but in any case, Cooper tries to leave and he is assaulted by the doppelganger of that tree. The lump of flesh in its head is kind of yellowy and he screams non-existent and Cooper falls through the floor of the black lodge, which apparently can come apart. Something we didn't know before, which is kind of cool. Um, he falls through oblivion, uh, black oil. I don't, I don't know. He's falling yeah. through outer space, something. And he, he eventually lands in this, you know, basement on, like, a big purple-hued waterway. <laughs> I'm just going to let you go, man, because yeah, I'm... Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. I mean, this is <laughs> the best I could do. He, <clears throat> in, in, you know, once he goes inside, he encounters a woman whose eyes are, like, sewn shut. And oh, yeah. the movements are very strange. Like it's it's stilted movements. He can't, you know, he can't hear her speech. It comes off like little clicks and buzzes. And there is a a giant like plug receptacle on the wall with the number fifteen. There's also some threatening presence banging right. on the door to get in. Okay, the <laughs> women without eyes leads Dale up a ladder, which appears to take them <laughs> like a satellite in outer space. Literally, like there's the stars, they appear to be floating in space. And this this woman like flips a switch and electrocutes her. She flies off into space. And Cooper sees the, the head of uh, actor Don S. Davis playing the character of Major Briggs from the original Twin Peaks, who says Blue Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, Blue Rose was a concept introduced in uh, the movie Fire Walk With Me which um, only solidified here in the parts we've seen, even of the new series, it, it seems to signify a, a, a strange case, a case of supernatural, of some supernatural origin. Um, Cooper goes back inside this weird space satellite, and now things are not skipping and jumping ahead, um, but the, the outlet on the wall now reads, has the number three on it, and there's another woman there, played by an actress who played another character on the series originally, who played the character of Ronette Pulaski. Uh, when Laura Palmer was murdered, she was with another girl, and that girl escaped, um, you know, with, and she was in a coma for a while, but that, that actress, Phoebe Augustine, um, she, she played this role and is credited as American Girl. Okay. In any case, she, she talks backwards and, you know, tells Cooper that, you know, he's running out of time. He... He tries to, you know, he approaches this wall plug thing and, you know, he sort of like hits, you know, it seems like he hits like an invisible shield. But what we realize is that he needs to go through the outlet. So <laughs> to bring it up to speed with what you said, Agent Cooper basically leaves the Black Lodge by getting sucked through a power outlet. 
This <laughs> makes only slight sense because in Firewalk With Me, the residents of the Black Lodge, the Red Room, kind of introduced the concept that they can move between worlds through electricity. Now, okay. again, what that means, we don't really fully understand, although we see it. You know, we see Cooper literally get sucked through a wall outlet, and yes, his shoes fall off. It's just like when I first saw this, my initial thoughts of, uh, of episode, uh, was this three? Episode three? Yes. Was him basically just like, it's just like a still of him being like, he's just like flying around. <laughs> like I compared it to uh, the flat Stanley. I don't know if you're familiar with. Uh, I know flat Stanley. Yeah. People talk about, but uh, you know, he's just like, here he is. And he's like, you know, and, and then here he goes over here. And it, it, I don't know. It was just, uh, you know, I'm totally cool with, you know, odd things, but th this was, a bit, you know, I'm going to need a few more rewatches to kind of process this. Oh yeah. And, and, and like I said, like on the first watch through, like I, I openly admit I was laughing out loud at some of this stuff. <laughs> like it's just, you can't believe what you're watching. You know, you're watching your main character, like get pulled through an electrical outlet. And you know, like we mentioned earlier, the doppelganger Cooper has arranged something. It's sort of unclear how he did it, but he, he arranged some way that our Cooper swaps places with this other guy, Dougie Jones. And all of this is kind of precipitated by another concept that was introduced in Firewalk with me, which is that the character of Bob, sort of the threatening mm -hmm. villainous murderer character is, is after what they call Garmin Bosia, which translates to, uh, like, I think it's pain and suffering, but it looks like cream corn. So uh, again, it, <laughs> saying these things out loud is somewhat somewhat ludicrous. But um, it, basically, Dougie Jones throws up, and he throws up cream corn. Right. This 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 I don't know sacrificial act. This this thing that he does kind of allows the Black Lodge to lock on him, and it sucks him away. Meanwhile, Doppelganger Cooper eventually does also hurl. And uh, throw up with some truly gross, truly wonderful throwing up sound design. <laughs> throwing up like cream corn and blood and black bile. It was terrible. Um, yeah, he was like covering his mouth like that, and it was yeah, just, it's just like <laughs> shooting out of him like a river, it was but like a like a Play-Doh machine almost. <laughs> yes. Play and uh, you know, our, so D Dougie Jones unfortunately finds himself in the Black Lodge where he meets a very strange fate is you know he sort of shrinks he's also wearing a ring which was significant right. in fire walk with me it's it's a ring with a symbol from a cave in twin peaks called owl cave and this symbol is sort of representative of the black lodge and mm -hmm. and uh, has, has some connections with with laura palmer and and the murder victim Teresa palmer from earlier in that movie um his, you know, the, the ring falls off his finger, he shrinks, his hand shrinks, and his head pops off, and he becomes a gold pearl. I, <laughs> I, I, I can tell you that's what happened, I can't tell you what it means or what the heck's going on with it. Um, but in any case, this has allowed the doppelganger to avoid getting sucked back. R. Cooper comes back into the world. He literally, like a cloud of black smoke, shoots mm -hmm. out of the power outlet, forms into Dale Cooper... And there he is. But this is a Cooper who doesn't seem to have his memories. He, he barely knows how to walk or talk or do anything. Um, it should be noted that this was another uh, benefit of uh, Showtime. When we first meet Dougie Jones, he's sitting there with a uh, completely naked hooker, uh, <laughs> Jade, mm -hmm. um, played by a gorgeous actress, um, who I, I would argue is probably the nicest character to, to Cooper, to this incapacitated Cooper. Who I think to any normal person I'd be like, did this guy have a stroke? Like, let's call nine one one. But everybody else just keep kind of keeps you know passing him along. Yeah, I think but, she says that at one point because I, I think you had a stroke. Call for help. Yeah. Call right. for help. Yeah, she she at least gets him to a place where conceivably people would help him, although they don't. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, part three of the new Twin Peaks is um, uh, it's it's challenging TV. I'll say that it's challenging TV. Upon rewatch, I think even though you don't really understand it, you still get what's happening. It makes log it makes logical sense within the rules that we're seeing of, of this world. Um, but I can definitely understand how people who were maybe only casual fans of Twin Peaks originally would have been thrown by this stuff. 
it, it really <laughs> is like, you know, David Lynch dream fuel. Well, it's, you spend a lot of time in the black lodge, I think is, is really, and it's, you know, anything goes, you know, it's just yeah. a weird place where weird things happen. And yeah, you know, it's, you know, someone like David Lynch can just go crazy with the weird stuff he wants to do, right. which is cool. You know, I just, I, you know, maybe some of this stuff will be revealed later on why things happen. Right. I feel like, you know, either a lot of people are, are trying to associate things together or, or, you know, this is going to actually make somewhat of some sense eventually, hopefully. Right. Um, because, you know, you, you go on forums or message boards or whatever, people are going crazy about what's actually happening. You know, the, yeah. the, the story. Um, we, but, um, uh, oh, go ahead. we actually stumbled on something last. Well, actually, no, I, I don't want to take credit because actually I think someone on Reddit might have figured it out first or there's another uh, another youtube channel out there called the vlog lady um i've checked out uh some of the videos over there good stuff but that's a great there name. is a there is a yeah it is a great name there's a <laughs> there's a theory out there that everything we've been seeing like from the perspective of of like in uh you know doppelganger cooper is taking place quote unquote <clears throat> present day, but for, for, for twin peaks present day, I think is 2015, but again, present day. The theory is that our Cooper who's come out of the black lodge is not in the same time. He came out in 2003, not 2015. And there's a little bit of evidence for this. Somebody like zoomed in on the license plate of Dougie's car on the driveway and it's very fuzzy. It's weird. Like this is an HD movie, but like the, the only pictures I can find are really fuzzy and unclear. But it, it looks like the expiration date of, of like, you know, the little tag on his license plate is 2003, which, wow, mind blown. If he's not in the same time, like mind blown, like that's crazy. But um, on, on top of I think there's some other evidence too. like, you know, j just the fact that the slot machines that kind of play a big role later in that episode, uh, could the, the, the dull version of Cooper is being guided by the black lodge can apparently find any, uh, any, any slot machine that's ready to give up its jackpot. So he basically wins like 29 straight jackpots. But, um, those, those machines give out coins. And I think it right. was, uh, Cameron has noted that, Present day, even even in 2015, those machines don't really do that anymore. They give out, you know, they'll give you a slip if you win. You don't just get like a giant, you know, bucket full of coins anymore. Even I don't know, the, whether, the that's, I don't know whether that's true. Yeah, slot not, I'm not really. I mean, I, I know like if you hit a huge jackpot, it's not going to spit out twenty thousand dollars worth of quarters or whatever. But uh, right, I, I'm just not sure. I don't. I don't do that enough to know. Right. I don't, I don't know either, but that, that was some of the other evidence, but it kind of would make some sense. Like, you know, now it's like, I, I haven't, I haven't done enough research since I found this to see, you know, if the cars we're seeing are, you know, newer than 2013 or I'm sorry, or 20, 2003 or whatever. But if so, like, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Like, it just makes you wonder, you know, with, with as much story has been unfurled in these first four parts, I mean, gosh, I can't wait for part five. Like what the heck's going to happen next? Um, That's a very interesting theory, man. Because I, you know, I haven't looked at it with that knowledge. So it, you know, maybe the the way people are dressing is from, you know, thirteen, fourteen years ago. Well, and it, and part of it is too is like I was trying to feel like just the significance of the numbers on the plug. So in that very strange basement okay. of the Black Lodge, for lack of a better term, the purple room, some people are calling it. Um, you know, I mentioned there were numbers. The first number that was on it was a 15. Mm -hmm. After Dale went out and they flipped the switch and the girl flew off into space, when he comes back downstairs, it now says three. And there, was, there just was so much like agonizing, oh, gosh, what could these numbers mean? And, you know, what if it's just very, you know, the numbers are straightforward. It's literally the year. Um, so if he had gone immediately, it would have been present day. But since yes, he waited... He, Yes, but since he he went out and came back in, or she flipped that switch it, again, or you know, and that's just the thing is, I am not certain. You know, we we are seeing events somewhat differently. And remember, there was the piece too where Doppelganger Cooper asked for that mechanic he was working with, who he killed in a very odd way. He like squished his face or whatever. Um, I didn't like that. Yeah, it was very off. It was very odd like off-putting. You know, it was kind of unsettling, <laughs> but. Um, in any case, he wanted him to, to rewire the car, and I didn't know what that meant, but I wonder if, like, very literally, 
you know, Doppelganger Cooper, because he's, you know, from the Black Lodge, he understands how the channels of electricity work coming from that world. So he kind of cross-patched Cooper so that he didn't come to the right place. I mean, I don't know. I, it's just, you know, the, the possibilities are, are, are endless here. I mean, I think what, what, what the show has shown us in the first four parts is that anything is possible. Like, I, I literally have no idea where this is going to go next. Yeah. But that is for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's worth <laughs> noting that um, – so the first four parts had very cryptic – I guess – I mean, I think the episodes don't really have titles. I think they technically are just called part one, part two, etc. cetera. But they did come out with descriptions, which are – again, they're, they're short enough to be titles. But so part one, even even though when they aired, parts one and two were kind of aired together as a, as a movie – um, you know, when you stream them now, you watch them as separate parts, part one, two, three, four. Um, part one was my log has a message for you. And that one was pretty straightforward that mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the log lady calls Deputy Hawk and says that. Um, part two was called the stars turn and a time presents itself. Also a line of dialogue from the log lady. But again, both things have a very literal meaning in the episodes. Like it's pretty clear what... Um, now that we've seen it, we kind of get what that means. Uh, part three, uh, also having seen it, very literal title, Call for Help, <laughs> which is uh, yeah, something that, that Agent Cooper, that's really one of the few things he's able to say. Um, and then um, part four brings back some memories, which uh, is is from the, the scene at the, the Twin Peaks Sheriff Station with uh, Bobby Briggs, who's now a Twin Peaks Sheriff's deputy, which is pretty interesting. Um but Showtime did release, um, again, descriptions, titles, whatever you want to call them. They're brief enough. They don't tell you anything for parts five, six, seven, and eight. And so part five is case files. Part six is don't die. Part seven is there's a body, all right. And part eight is got a light. Um, I you know, based on what we've seen from the previous episodes, I mean, got a light could just literally be dialogue. There's a body. All right. Could be dialogue. I mean, all this could be dialogue. It could be very literal until we see it. We won't know, but, um, I mean, I'm certainly inspired to keep going. I mean, that, I mean, again, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, not I'm, sure I'm really I'm, intrigued. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that's, you know, the least I could say, you know, it's not that I'm, that I'm not enjoying what I'm seeing. It's just, uh, I don't know. It's different, you know, and, you know, having having just watched the the other seasons, uh, you know, I don't know. It just it, uh, it's, it is not it's not your it's not your your grandpappy's Twin Peaks. I'll say that. I mean, that, that much is clear. <laughs> if that's even, what, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think you may have said you were uh, Cameron may have said this that uh, you know your your second time viewing you enjoyed it more. Yes, um, and yeah, that was definitely the case with me as well. I, I found like I, this is this is what when I was watching the first four episodes, I, this was me on my couch for pretty much four hours straight. Yeah, <laughs> you're just gasping like, constantly. I was just I was just like <laughs> locked in, like I was letting it wash over me. And yeah. again, some of it was so strange too. Like, yeah. I'm just like my mind is just like working like so like right. trying to understand. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, um, I. Well, so and, and here's the thing too is that you know David Lynch keeps keeps calling them parts because he thinks of it all as one big movie. Right. If if we take and I, I said this on the uh, the other the other podcast I do with Cameron, but if we if we take that literal and we think that this is one big movie broken into pieces, and there's 18 parts. Well, a movie typically falls into a three act structure. And so I just find myself, you know, it, it makes sense to me then that parts one through four, which is all we have to go on right now, are still very much table setting, yeah, reintroducing mm -hmm. us to people, setting the groundwork, making introductions, you know, beginning to, to lay right. out some of the plot threads. But to me, I am, again, I, I, I want to see part five, of course, but to me, part six is going to be very telling because in, in you know, if, if we're, you know, going with that movie logic, you know, you always want each act break to kind of propel you into the next act. 
you know, to put right. you into a, posa- a place where, you know, your characters are forced into a bad situation or they can't go back. It's, you know, point of no return kind of a thing. So it seems to me like part six could really have some, some serious, uh, some serious events going on. And then, you know, similarly, uh, part, Part twelve, I think, will be an interesting, uh, you know, segment. Again, not to say they all aren't going to be interesting, but if we're following that logic, if it really does fit that movie mold, I just wonder if it's going to follow that kind of that kind of stream. Um, it's it's hard to define this because again, we can call them episodes. I mean, they are airing in parts. That's what episodes do. But you know, they don't seem to function like episodes because even in serialized shows. You know, the episodes still sort of try to ground you where you are. These definitely don't feel like that. They feel like a very literal continuing story. I mean, just quite literally, the the separation between parts two and three, our character spent the end of part two falling through oblivion. He picks up in part three, still just falling from oblivion. I mean, very literally continuing, continuing that. Um, well, I, I suppose technically speaking, part two ended with a um, a band in the Roadhouse. Uh, the the band was the Chromatics playing a song called Shadow, which I would argue was the most Twin Peaksy scene of of the whole first four parts that we've seen. You know, mm-hmm. David Lynch loves to play with moody, emotional music. Yeah. You know, characters looking longingly at one another. There was mm-hmm. a lot of that going on in that scene. I felt very much like if anything was a nostalgic Twin Peaks scene, that was it. The end of part two. What was your thought on that? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, what did you think about the music in general? I think what three of the episodes have ended basically with the musical number in that uh, bar club area. Yeah, I, I thought in at the end of part two, I thought that it was a very powerful I thought it was a very powerful ending. And and like mm-hmm. I say, like I, I, I reacted very emotionally to that. I thought it really again seeing seeing James Hurley again, seeing Shelley again, a few new characters popped up in there. Uh, Balthasar Getty will be playing a role in this new Twin Peaks. He he didn't say or really do anything, but he was there. Really? Um, I missed him. Balthazar Getty was the guy at the bar who's kind of given the finger gun to Shelley. Which, okay, let's face it, yeah. if I saw Match and Amik, I think I'd give her the finger gun, too. Um, <laughs> I'm actually a big fan of Balthazar Getty. He's done yeah, really yeah cool so stuff. He's a, he was credited as a character, Red. But again, he didn't really do anything, so okay. you know, we'll learn more about Red as the, as the, the show goes on. Um, but it just, it, it was a good ending there. Part three ended similarly with a band, and I, I don't know the name of that band, but it ended with a band, and I thought that was okay. I thought part four's ending with the band. It's not that I didn't like the band. It's not that I didn't like the song. It seemed to me like that ending felt like more of more. It was jarring. I, I, I didn't, I sort of hope every episode doesn't just end with a musical, you know, performance. Cause it, it episode four just wasn't organic. You know, we sort of ended on a very strong Gordon Cole, um, uh, Albert, Albert Rosenfield scene. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden just jump into the roadhouse with right. this band playing. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I, I think I sound like I'm being critical and I don't mean to be, I, I just, you know, I, I hope that this isn't like the template for the season. That's just every episode is going to end with a different band. I know, mm-hmm. I know David Lynch is a huge, you know, he's a huge musical fan. I mean, he's That's a what I was going to say. You can tell that yeah. he's a fan of music. I mean, I get that. But I guess I just wish – I don't know. From what I've seen, again, episode – part four is really the only one where I have the major complaint. It's just that it just – it really did kind of take me out of things. Like it was very jarring. I, I hope I hope that that's not what we're going to do every episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If there's a way to do it organically, then maybe I guess I don't mind. But seeing as that you know one-fourth of what we've already seen, <laughs> it was kind of done inelegantly, I – that you know, I, I just hope we, we maybe have a different approach. I didn't have a problem with it. Uh, it. Maybe it's just a way to book in these things into some sort of a episodic format because that's what it's got to come out as, right? You know, your your uh, you know your I guess eighteen hour long movie needs to be broken up. Uh. Yeah, and the, and that maybe there's not an elegant like break point mm-hmm. all the time, so you know, having these musical performances gives you, well, that's the thing. I think because the credits run over it, I think it, mm-hmm. it's, it's an opportunity to let the credits run and, you know, you're not running over actual content. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, music is content, but I mean, you know what I mean. Um, like I say, I, I'm not, I'm not truly complaining about it, but I, <laughs> it's, I just, I, I hope that it's just done with a little more elegance than, than that last bit we saw. But I am enjoying the music. Like I, I do, like I thought the chromatic song just, a, like, again, I, I added that to my, uh, I added that to one of my playlists on Spotify. Oh, really? um, I think it's pretty catchy. And, um, God, the actor, not the actress, the, um, the lead singer for that group, uh, I think I looked her up. Her name is Ruth Radelet, Radelet, very French sounding name. So I could be butchering it, but my God, she's gorgeous and uh, very talented too. I, you know, beautiful singer, but I just like mm -hmm. I, her, her, like her looks are hypnotic. Um, so from Portland. <laughs> is she from Portland? Oh, well, I get the name. Sure, that's where the band is from. The, yeah. The, the, she sounds, she, the name sounds French, but yeah, yeah. From Portland. Um, and I've listened to some of their other songs now. Again, they've got a good, they got a, a neat kind of uh, a neat sound. But don't they I, yeah, do I, thought a lot that, of I thought that was strong. Lynchy type music, like don't they have some like kind of like uh, I guess dedications to you know Lynch they do. style? I think I've I've seen some of that posted around. They do. Yeah, it very much seems like you know David Lynch just found a bunch of musicians he likes and just put it because oh, yeah, you know uh, Eddie Eddie Vedder and Trent Reznor are going to be in this show, and I think oh, a lot wow. of people were wondering are they going to be are they going to be playing characters? And I think now that we've seen what we have, I think they're just going to be playing music in the Roadhouse. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe Trent Reznor is going to be like an actual guy, you know, who does stuff. But I think it's just likely that maybe they'll just be in there. You know, book ending an episode. Uh, you know, singing a song. And I haven't seen Eddie Vedder do an acting role since uh, Singles. <laughs> yeah, nineteen ninety two, something like that. Yeah. So on our other show, though, we were actually picking on um, a little bit, picking on uh, Krista Bell. She's also a musician. Musician. She doesn't. Oh, really? She hasn't so far performed musically in the show. She's playing uh, Special Agent Tamara Preston, who. Um, to get a little Twin Peaks geeky here for just a brief moment, um, Mark Frost released a book called The, the Secret History of Twin Peaks, um, and Tamara Preston played kind of like a meta character in the book. The, the book is – it's kind of like an, an apostolary uh, book where it's letters and articles and journals all compiled – by an archivist and we learn who that archivist is you know in, in the course of the book but then the the dossier is being reviewed by an fbi special agent tamara mm -hmm. preston who was given the assignment by gordon cole um and i actually i listened to the audiobook of it i also have the, the physical copy too but i i was just sort of thrown because the the tamara preston from the audiobook comes off very differently than, than Christabel's portrayal of the character on the show. Um, I just, I, I don't know. She, she's overacting a little bit to me. I don't know what yeah. vibe you got off her. I, I agree with that. She also appeared kind of too young to me to, to be having that role, but she's actually a little older than I thought she was. Yeah, I think she's, she's actually older 30. than me. So. Yeah, she's yeah. Uh, in her, almost 40. Oh, is she? Oh, um, well, looking good for that. But yeah, that's um, what I thought. I would have, I would have guessed early twenties, but uh, yeah, um, she, yeah, I, I agree with that. It's um, and, and again, it's like I, I, and I hate picking on someone's performance because I mean, you know, David Lynch might have told her to be that way, you know, to kind of play it up, you know, be a little right, hammy. Right. Um, and so it's, I, I don't want to pick on that too much, but it, she is, she, she's like, she just, she took me out of those scenes a little bit was all, yeah, you know, you, you've got like two, like, I want to see Gordon Albert like doing stuff. And then she's there going like, ah, you know, <laughs> you know, when Gordon makes her leave. Um, so it just, it, it was just kind of odd. And I, you know, I hope maybe we get more from her and that role fleshes out a little bit more other, other than just, uh, you know, swaying hips as she walks away. <laughs> which, well, you know, uh, Speaking of swaying hips, uh, how did you feel about uh, Denise being being the head of the FBI? I like that. I, I like that. And I actually made note of something that I hadn't really seen mentioned elsewhere. Um, I made note of it yesterday that when we meet so, – so David Duchovny plays a um, – an LGBT character, a transsexual character, whatever, whatever nomenclature, nomenclature you want to apply to it. He, he plays a, 
um, a, a man who's become a woman. He's a woman now. And um, on the original Twin Peaks, that's when that character was introduced as a DEA agent who investigates Cooper in the course of one of those season two plot lines that people like to hate on. Um, in the course of those those episodes, he is a DEA agent. He's, he's investigating right. the drug angle associated with Cooper. In the new Twin Peaks, though, what we learn is he never was a DEA agent. He was working undercover. He's an FBI agent who was working undercover for mm-hmm. Golden, Gordon Cole, which mm-hmm. I, it's it's a plot point that I don't think will amount to anything or really have any significance. But I just thought it was interesting that yeah. this new series has sort of retconned that character's history um, and done it in, I think, a very elegant way. You know, just right. in this line of dialogue, Gordon Cole says it. Um, and it doesn't diminish the character or do anything, but I, I just thought it was interesting that they kind of changed that. Um, but to, sorry, to answer your question directly, um, I liked him. I'm a huge, I mean, again, I'm a huge David Duchovny fan. I think yeah. he, I mean, hell, I thought David Duchovny was pretty good on uh, Red Shoe Diaries. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> so, He's good in everything, right? I mean, this is, is like right before the X-Files. I mean, uh, you know, the original yeah. series. Yeah. He's a, you know, I think he's a good actor and, and it's, it's, you know, it's funny. I, I thought this was true of him on Twin Peaks when he played uh, Denise um, before, mm-hmm. but it's still true now. Like he plays the character, you know, he, there would, I think there was an element of humor in the character originally, but it was never like at the, it was never like the, the character itself was a joke. It was kind of more like other people interacting with the character weren't sure how to take her. Mm-hmm. But it, you know, if you really think about, you know, Twin Peaks was in 19, it, th- these episodes aired in 91. Um, it was a really a progressive, a progressive was, character, you know, um, you know, some people may, may not like that. I mean, I'm not, th- those aren't really my issues. I like to champion. I don't, I don't care, but you know, again, right. I, I even, but I can recognize right. the significance that I mean, here was a character kind of ahead of, ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I yeah. thought that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I didn't think that, you know, like you said, I, I didn't think the character itself was a joke at all. Yeah. I think it was, it was taken very seriously. You know, he liked to, uh, you know, dress like a woman. He, he yeah. wanted to be a woman, but, uh, you know, I think it was kind of an opportunity to lay a few, you know, puns and, you know, a few yeah. jokes about, you know, needing a, I had to get a pair of brass balls or, you know, yeah. he said, you know, a few, a few one liners like that, but you know, it was all just, you know, I don't really think it was in bad taste at all. No. And I thought bringing him into the season uh, here was great. I yeah, mm-hmm. I, I thought the you know it was just it was kind of nice to see the the character again. And again, the company mm-hmm. plays him well. Um, it's it's an opportunity to see him interact with Gordon Cole, and you know I'll mm-hmm. always take more Gordon Cole. Um, yeah. It was kind of and it was nice to get a little bit of backstory too on the character we didn't have before, where you know she yeah. she kind of explained like, hey, you know, one day I was on a case and. I had to dress like a woman and I just, you know, I kind of liked it and it grew from mm-hmm. there. It was nice to see Gordon kind of fleshing out a little bit of that history. You know, I remember once upon a time you were kind right. of a confused wild thing, you know? So, you know, just, just hearing that it wasn't the simple thing that she made it out to be uh, in Twin Peaks before. It's nice that if you're going to do of all the scenes in Twin Peaks, the, the new series, I think I haven't really been pandered to, like, I don't think they've done that. That scene might come the closest, though, because when you think about, you yeah. know, what narratively does that scene really give us? Other than having, other than having, you know, Duchovny show up, like, I don't, I feel like you could cut well, that scene and we're not going to miss anything. Yeah, other than show us that, you know, Denise really wanted to go, but he took uh, the other girl instead, uh, she, Christabel. Yeah. Went, well, went to visit I, uh, well, see, now, South Dakota. Is, yeah, is that I, – I don't know that I perceived it that way. Oh, really? Do you think he wanted – I'm sorry. Do you think she wanted to go? I, I thought it was more that he was going to see her because she was the head of personnel. And I guess if he's going to, like, resource out an agent, he needed to kind of get her sign-off or something. I mean, it seems odd because, I mean, he's already, like, a okay. deputy director in the FBI. I don't know why he would need to do that. But – um yeah, no, it's a fair point. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like you said, it, it it very well probably is pandering in some way. Yeah, I almost like to say, you know, look, we, you know, we were before, you know, when this was a progressive thing, you know, yeah. now it's, you know, become a, you know, big uh, topic of discussion, you know, yeah, in, uh, you know, uh, politics and, you know, uh, uh, media and stuff like that. But yeah, 
Um, it, yeah, I could totally see how it would come off as pandering, but I liked it, and I had a problem with it. Uh, and I, I liked how it. it and, and I liked how it married the the. I'll put them in air quotes because I don't believe this, but it 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 married the doldrums of season two with what we're seeing now. Because one of the fears I had going in was that the show was going to be all Laura Palmer ignoring things that happened in season two, like after Laura's murder was solved that they didn't like. And so the fact that they brought Denise in, I mean, Denise comes in, like, I think it's, it's sort of general opinion. Uh, You know, there's no consensus or anything on this kind of thing, but general opinion is like those initial episodes right after Laura's murder is solved. And Denise shows up like one episode, maybe two episodes after that. Like those are some of the roughest, uh, those are some of the roughest episodes. So I, I, I'm just glad that they introduced her. It's a way of kind of saying like, no, we're, we're acknowledging we're bringing in the whole series. The whole show is fair game. Um, and you know, Cameron was even sort of espousing a theory on the other channel that, you know, Dark Cooper might ha- somehow have Wyndham Earl's soul in him or something. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's definitely a possibility, man. <laughs> yeah, and there's been there's been like subtle nods at it too, because in the in the in the room with the glass box, there was a bonsai tree, and you know, Wyndham Earl used the bonsai tree with a listening device. I I don't know that I believe that's what's happening. I think. It, it, you know, like I've said, like literally if that did happen, I, I guess it wouldn't surprise me because gosh, I feel, I, I feel like a tree could come to life and start, you know, talking to everybody. Oh wait, that already happened. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, again, I guess nothing would really shock me too bad, but um, I was just happy about that. To me, to me, De- Denise's inclusion, as much as it spoke to that kind of progressive thinking and whatever from the time, it was sort of like, you know what? all of Twin Peaks is valid here. We're bringing in this character and, you know, we're not just forgetting stuff. And, and I'm willing, like, and that's the thing is I'm not even like a diehard, like, oh my gosh, we need to have everything answered from season two. Like it's been 25 years. Right. I fully understand that, it, you know, there are certain things we, like, it seems plausible to me that we will never get an official answer about Leo Johnson. At the end of season two, Leo Johnson was the character I mentioned who had like poisonous spiders dangling over his head. Mm-hmm. We may never officially get the answer that Leo's dead, but I don't think he's going to appear, and I'm pretty sure he is dead. I'm not sure my heart's going to be broken by that. It would be nice if they would acknowledge it. I, I would certainly, you know, great, but I'm not going to be too broken up about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's big shoes to fill. You've got a lot of people you want to try to satisfy as well as do this new thing. Yep. To get a new audience, a younger audience. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's why it's so hard to do. I mean, yeah. that's why all these people, all these other shows try to do it, bring back, you know, X files, bring back, uh, I don't know, you name it, you know, whatever it has, has come, you know, made a resurgence. Right. It's, it's hard to do and do it well. It really is. Right. Well, Jay, I could talk twin peaks for, for hours and hours on end. Why don't we, uh, why don't we bring the twin peaks discussion to a close? I'll let you have the, uh, well, what, what's, uh, what's, what's your final word on, on the, the four parts you've seen so far. I'll tell you what, if we can do this in some sort of format, that's not four episodes at one time, it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> yes. Digesting just, you know, 60 minutes of this right. crazy content would be great. No, I agree. Um, it, it's going to be that they, they've pretty much announced that, you know, from now until the end of summer, um, it's going to be one part every Sunday mm-hmm. and then the final, the, the, you know, the parts eight parts 17 and 18 will be a two hour event. Um, and again, I'm sure, I'm sure Showtime will probably run the, the preceding 16 parts right in front of it too. So, you know, you can do the binge if you need to, but, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be more digest digestible chunks here going forward. You know, hearing your thoughts actually, you know, actually makes me even more intrigued. I, I want to go back and, and watch again. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I have a lot of problems with it. I still do. Um, yeah. I don't even get into all of those I have, but um, I, I'm really intrigued by the show. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm, I really want to know what's going to happen in the future. And, uh, right. yeah, man, I look forward to it. I want to know what uh, Blue Rose is. Yeah. I don't know that you're ever going to get a concrete answer to that, but I think, we, I think, frankly, I think we've gotten as much of an answer about Blue Rose as we're going to get. Oh, really? And it, it is effectively, you know, a case, a strange case, like an X-Files case, a supernatural mm-hmm. case, something mm-hmm. along those lines. I, I don't know that we're ever going to walk out and have like a definition of Blue Rose officially given. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say though, that uh, if you haven't seen the missing pieces yet, 
it would probably be worthwhile to, to try and seek that out before Sunday. I don't yeah, know. I've, if, I've tried to find it. I, I just, you know, I, I think I'm gonna have to end up buying the set. Un, I, unfortunately, like, if I'm not mistaken, because I've I've tried looking to to see if there's anywhere I can just watch a quick yeah. peek at various parts of it. I think it is only available through that set. On you uh-huh. know, I'm certain. There's probably uh, sites yeah. of ill repute where you sure. can download them or, or do whatever <laughs> illegally, but uh, yeah, I think they're only available through the through the set. But the reason I say this is because there are things in the missing pieces which very much are in play in the new show. Okay. Um, like again, I made reference to electricity in the movie. You watched it three times, so maybe you were able to get that. Mm-hmm. The movie makes it a lot clearer what they're saying about the the red the, the red room people are saying about you know, uh, intercourse between worlds, electricity, you know, again, I'm not saying it's crystal ball clear. It's clear as mud, but there's, there's a little (laughs) bit more content that gives you context that, you know, you'll kind of then think back on what you've seen in the first four parts. And it might, you know, a couple, a couple bells will start to go off for you. I think it's also just good. There's some, you know, there's, there's characters that have since died like Pete, Pete was one of my favorite characters from the original Twin Peaks, and unfortunately, um, he uh, he passed away in the years since uh, since the show was first on. He had an odd death too. He he died as I think complications of a blood clot he got in some kind of a bar fight, if I'm not mistaken. I think he died in like Italy. He got into a bar fight, and then he died several days later from you know complications from from some injuries he sustained there. Um, really? Yeah. I, look it up. It's interesting because uh, there's some of that stories online. Jack Nance, is that right? Jack, there it is. Jack Nance. I'm sorry, his, his real name was escaping me. Yeah, longtime David Lynch collaborator. You know, the star of Eraserhead. Jack Nance. Uh-huh. Uh, he he died. Um, I think back in ninety ninety six, maybe. Yeah, I don't right. know. It was mid nineties. I mean, he didn't make it too long after the show. But again, it's sad. It's not like he just died because he was old. He died from you know kind of an unfortunate unfortunate thing. No, you're right. It was ninety six. You hit it yeah. right on the head. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's a scene with Pete in the missing pieces, which is, you know, the, the, that's that's the only new Pete footage you're ever going to get in your lifetime here. So um, it it's a scene that you can understand why it was cut out of the film, but I just like it. It's, you know, classic Pete. Josie's in that scene too, you know, who we last saw stuck in a drawer pull. So uh, again, there's just, there's some good, it's, it's nostalgic stuff. You know, it's not all of it's relevant sure. to the new series, but, um, I, again, like I say, I, if you're, if you're interested and it seems like you're kind of getting in the, in the spirit of things, the missing pieces are worth pursuing. Um, Absolutely. But, um, I think we should probably start winding down. You know, I don't know. I don't know if I have the endurance to do a sausage factory, uh, you know, four and a half hour sure. thing for the first show. It's um, fine with me, man. We had a lot of stuff to get through this first episode. Certainly. But, um, I think maybe just to finish up, like what uh, what are you looking forward to this summer from from TV content? Because because the thing that I think is interesting now is, you know, the summer is not just this dead zone for TV anymore. You know, like for you know Better Call. Yeah, I know you don't watch Better Call Saul, but just as an example, Better Call Saul is still on. You know, it's going to go into into June. Game of Thrones comes back in July. Uh, Fargo is still on. You know, there's new shows that even haven't even started up yet. Again, Game of Thrones is an example, but. You know, I just wonder, is there anything anything coming out you're, you're looking forward to, ready to dig into? Yeah, Game of Thrones is definitely, you know, top on the docket. Um, yeah, we'll have to talk about that uh, in, in weeks and, to come. Uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually a relatively new fan of the show. Um, I, I just got into it a couple of years ago. Nice. So, um, yeah, I finally got tired of hearing people talking about it and uh, not being in on the loop. So, uh, But, you know, it's HBO. It's great stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that and yeah, – uh, solid. That's all I can really think of that that hasn't started yet, uh, right off the top of my head. I was trying to pull together some info. I, I was trying to figure out, like, well, what's what's coming out? Because you know they always have those like those summer TV things. Mm-hmm. You know, just you, you know, again, we you know we're so clever. We called this Plateau TV. You know, a take on uh, Peak TV. It, the reason they call it that is kind of twofold. One is one is uh, a positive thing. One I think is meant derisive peak TV in the sense that you're getting some really good, really quality TV shows, but then peak TV in the sense that you're getting so much, not all of it good. So like, for example, God, Fear the Walking Dead comes back. That's a show I I watched the first season and then I was done. That show was terrible. Totally pissed me off. Did you, did you watch that show? Did you stay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen up up to current so far. Oh, you have? Uh, I, 
it, to me, it it didn't. And again, I don't want to I don't want to open up a new debate. We're trying to wind down, but it, to me, sure. that show did not live up to what it was billed to be. That show was like, hey, we're gonna show you like what happened when the zombie when it's when this all first started. And I know that they've always been weird about not wanting to reveal the the origin or the science behind the zombies, and I'm fine with that. But like the first season of that show. You know, the first episode was as much real world as we got. And then if I remember correctly, it was like the second or third episode had this giant time jump, like of a week. And it was like, oh, oh man, yeah. world's really going to hell in that week. I was yeah. like, why didn't we get to see that? Like, yeah. that? I thought that was the whole point of the show. We were going to see like the world fall into we, chaos. We In like three episodes, we went from, you know, basically the same thing that we already see in The Walking Dead. Yeah. And then we missed the whole uh, transition period, I guess. Right. Like th- to me, that's what I thought that show again, I always figured the show would eventually sort of catch up and be telling just sort of an alternate version of what we already, you know, the main walking dead show. But a- at the time when I quit, I was kind of like, you know what? I already watched this show and it's called the walking dead and it's a lot better. And even as much as the original show pisses me off, I still think it is a lot better. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I, the-, the whole walking dead thing just kind of was pissing me off. So but but again, as an example, that's one show that's that's coming back. Um, you know, Sci-Fi Channel has some shows that come on. Um, I think USA. Actually, there's a show called Winona Earp, which is kind of like a s- supernatural series on Sci-Fi. I keep meaning to to look into, but yeah, uh, again, I think that's on Netflix actually too. Um, uh, I th- yes, I think the first season's on there. So maybe what I'll do is I'll dig in. See that. See that's the point of the show. See we're we're, help, we're helping the viewers here, here Jay. Like we're helping maybe each other. Winona. Maybe Winona Ur- <laughs> and helping each other. That's true. Uh, maybe Winona Earp is something worth looking into. I'll have to. I'll try an episode of that out on. Uh... Oh, uh, you know the big the big thing that actually just came out. I can't believe I'm forgetting. I watched the the premiere last night. Um, House of Cards came back. It came oh out yeah. Yesterday, and the uh, the season five premiere, notable because the original showrunner left. I think <laughs> season four was his last. I didn't notice a huge difference from that regard. Still seemed pretty really? good. Um, Definitely becoming a little bit more outlandish with some of the stuff that's happening, but you know I'm kind of along for the ride now. It's still a good show, still chilling. Um, yeah, you know, I'll definitely probably be doing the binge as much as I can binge now with a daughter. Mm-hmm. But you yeah, know, it's, it's parent, tough. parent binge as much as you can. Um, yeah, I, I need to catch up. I'm only through season two on that show. I think. Yeah. Season two, but, season three. Yeah, but it's all you know. A lot of reality stuff comes off in the summer. There's some new show that TNT's been pushing, um, starring uh, Niecy Nash, who I feel like she was on something else that I watched, but I can't. Reno Nine One One. Was she on Reno Nine One One? That you yeah. know what she? Yeah, that's right. But she also, was uh, Renisha. That's right. That's right. I, I I couldn't. It was on the tip of my tongue. I knew she was on something. Um, but uh, Hank from Breaking Bad is on there too. I think he's uh, like a villainous character. Um, but again, I'm just again I'm not going to read every show that's coming out. But just there's a bunch of stuff coming out. Like you know, uh, Spike TV actually has a, a TV version of Stephen King's The Mist coming out, yeah. which I that was a, one I was going to bring up. Yeah, yeah, they had a pretty good uh, a trailer that that might be interesting worth trying out. Netflix has a, a female wrestling show set in the '80s starring Allison Brie, which I don't know. Alice and Brie wrestling other women. I think the, the premise has got me in for at least a few episodes. Uh, you a big uh, community fan? Uh, oh, God. Huge community fan. Yeah, there, In fact, community, since it's now completely available on uh, Hulu, you know, there's a show that I hadn't rewatched uh, ever. Like, I finally rewatched it a few months ago, and I was just I, – I remember – I was forgetting how good it was. Like, there's just some really solid, funny episodes – uh, in that series, um, you know, it's sort of got a long run that shows like Arrested Development didn't get, but Arrested Developments they just announced that's coming back again. They're going to get yep. a season five. Hopefully, they're going to set right what they didn't quite do well in season four. Hopefully, back yeah. a return to form. I hope. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. I, I didn't hate it. It, it. it didn't feel the same though. Season four, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't hate it either. But I mean, to me, it was, it was a different thing. I mean, I think if, I, if I'm trying to be mm-hmm. kind, that's what I would say. It wasn't going. It wasn't supposed to be like the original show, but you know, it. The original show was really strong, 
Mm-hmm. And I would even note that like it's final season, like season three of Arrested Development, as goofy as it kind of got, was very tight. Like there's a lot packed into a yeah. lot of like there's only thirteen episodes. Right. They they covered a lot, they did a lot, a lot of funny stuff. That's, so season, season four felt fairly sparse by comparison. You know, similar to, you know, what they did with uh, Twin Peaks, you know, they they moved the days around and then they eventually just, you know, yep. unloaded all the episodes like in one night. They had like four episodes in one night or something like that. Yeah. For, it's kind for, of funny um, watching it in retrospect because, you know, there's all this like meta stuff in, yeah. uh, I mean, heck, we, we could do a whole episode on uh, rest of development, oh, but yeah. they do like one where it's like, you know, cause they run a housing company and, and Michael's on the phone yelling. And it's like, but you cut our housing order from 22 to 18. And, but we, we had plans to build those four yeah. other houses and, you know, clearly they're talking about the episode order getting cut in season two, but, but yeah, oh, that's, yeah. Like, that was the kind of stuff I thought was funny. <clears throat> that whole season's full of that kind of uh, yeah. stuff like that, that, uh, oh yeah. yeah well, I, I, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, real quick, have you seen? There's a documentary on Arrested Development. Uh, there is. No, I haven't yes, seen that. It's on Amazon. I can't remember the name of it, but um, you should just be able to Google Arrested Development documentary. I will look and, into that uh, when we're done here. It's very interesting. It, it, it talks about all the stuff, and you know, like every every you know half season of that show, they they thought they were going to get canceled, so they were right. They were constantly thinking they're going to get canceled so that's it a really, really does, great great doc though it feels that way like it feels like every you know every few episodes it almost feels like the show reinvents itself in some sense like there's kind of big developments you know mm-hmm. the the roles get kind of switched around it's um, really sad man it's it's got a huge following not even just cult following just a general following behind it now yeah so gain popularity I, you know, after the fact it, to me i again as, as much as i feel bad about arrested development Arrested Development still got to tell a complete story. Like, if Arrested Development never came back, like, the end of season three is an end. You know, like, it, it, they got a pretty, like, they, they told a complete story. If anything, that's why season four kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth sometimes, because mm-hmm. uh, it ends on a pretty rough cliffhanger. Um, and so it's kind of like, gosh, you got to come back now. I mean, you yeah. had a you had a closed loop, and now you opened it again, and, and mm-hmm. you just left us dangling for years. Um, yeah, but, like, you know, but I, I juxtapose that with shows like Firefly. Yeah, Fire, you know, Firefly sort of got resolution in the movie. You know, you you can argue it does tell a complete story that can serve as an ending, but I just I think there's a lot more stories to tell there. And I wish you know, with all these shows coming back, it's kind of like you know, Joss Whedon, what the hell are you doing, man? Bring this show back. I don't know, man. I I almost feel like you know, let sleeping dogs lie sometimes. Like yeah, like Seinfeld, man. That's like one of my favorite all time shows. You know, I was watching Seinfeld when it didn't get canceled. You know, he pulled it off the air. He decided yeah. to continue it. And, but I mean, just look at the, you know, culture that that, just that show is, has given us. Yeah. You know, I mean, quit, quit while you're ahead, you know, kind of mentality, you know, in, you know, end when you're at the top of your game, you know, I mean, I think yeah. that's, that's really cool. You know, it's like a, if, you know, LeBron James retired right now or something, you know, I, that's true. I, the thing with Seinfeld, though, is that I feel like of all the various shows, like, again, like, Will and Grace is coming back. Like, who cares? I, I don't know why people are excited about that. But, um, again, I'm not saying it wasn't funny. I saw episodes of that show that actually were pretty funny. But I guess, like, Seinfeld has a real timeless quality. It would seem to me like Jerry Seinfeld could just do, you know, six episodes of Seinfeld every year, every couple of years, and that would mm-hmm. be awesome. Because, you know, again, in the last episode, you know, they went to jail or whatever, but who the hell cares? Just put yeah. them back in the apartment yeah. and have them do stuff today. It would be it would be great. I think you could do those same things, you know, now and see those characters now, and it would be just as good. Yes. I hear what you're saying, though. I mean, the fact that he went out on top, like, there's something to be commended about that. Because there are so many shows that, I mean, like, you know, I think the, the perfect test case is Dexter. Oh, my God. Dexter went on for friggin' like, five seasons too long. Yeah, we didn't, we definitely need to do a show on Dexter. Yeah, I, don't know I need if to you watch ever, more of Dexter. Watch, watched it all. But, I've, uh, I've not seen all of Dexter. Well, they're they're uh, in talks of bringing it back. So. Yep, I've seen that. I've seen that, <laughs> and and it's unclear. It's sort of unclear to me if it's a sequel or if it's a reboot or what it is, because the the people at Showtime they're sort of giving mixed messages about what they're making, but. You know. know, when they do stuff like that, I almost think they're just throwing out feelers to see what how people are going to react. Yeah. Um, you know, because I don't think uh, Michael C. Hall w- is going to come back. Uh, just because I know he was desperate to get out of there from the get-go. But Yeah. 
Well, he definitely he seemed to be phoning it in in the last few seasons anyway. Yeah, I mean, I get it, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, you you would be, uh, you know, nobody would know who you are without that show. But right. whenever people see your face, they think you're a you know, serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to get I, any roles, but. Well, and, and I, I can have some I can have some sympathy for him because it just ended. It's not like it ended like ten years ago. Like I thought, Dexter ended only like a couple of years ago. To talk about bringing it back already just feels weird to me. Yeah, when it, maybe twenty fifteen. It feels like it's been longer than that to me. But I I was not happy with the way that show ended. Twenty thirteen. I, mean, I, I would see even twenty thirteen. It's only twenty. It's only been four years. Like mm-hmm. we're gonna bring that show back already. Oh yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I've already seen that complaint about American Idol, which again is a completely different thing. I again, I'm not defending, but still, like American Idol, you know, they made this big whole thing. All oh, the final season, it's gonna be back already. It's only been gone like a, I mean, I think it's literally only been a year, like in terms of time. So I, I don't. And I read For what the show like, is though. I mean, it would be very easy to bring it back. You know, it's, right? If it got the viewers, that's all it would take. Right. No, well, that's what there, there was like, I actually read an article about that. That was some of the backstory there is that, you know, because it's going to be on ABC now. Fox was kind of like, well, well, hold on a second. Like you switch networks on us. That was not part of the plan. He's like, listen, we the, the show had to get canceled when it did because you guys weren't pulling in viewers anymore. But we still believed in the brand. We were talking about bringing it back. But we said, you know what? It hasn't been gone that long. We need to get people remembering it, people kind of missing it. And then the plan, I think, was to bring it back in like 2020. That was sort of tentatively what they had been talking about. But then I, I don't know if it's like the production company who makes American Idol. They didn't want to wait that long. They were running out of money, which is you know possible. And so they kind of pulled one over on Fox, and you know they just kind of put it out to bid, and ABC bid for it. I. I don't know. Again, it, I could care less about American Idol, but it's just it's interesting, and it just it kind of goes to that thing where, you know, Dexter hasn't been gone that long. American Idol hasn't again been, been gone that long. I, you know, I don't know. I don't need to see those things right away. Right no, me either. Either one of those things, I don't. I don't need to see. Yeah. Um, I feel like American Idol shows like that are way too scripted. You know, there's oh, too yeah. much of a narrative when there shouldn't be. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not a reality show in any sense of the word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Well, um, you know, before we go, Jay, I definitely I want to thank you for uh, for joining me here, and you know, for the the viewers at home, you know, you you pushed me to do this, and I don't mean like you you know you pushed me into doing something I didn't want to do, but you know, you were kind of like, hey man, let's let's do a show. We you know we got to talking about Justified, I think is what it was yeah. offline, and and some of the other shows we like definitely we should do a justified show when we, when we do one, we kind of talk about shows that are off now, but are worth revisiting or starting. If you never watched them, justified is one of those shows. I actually like to think that justified, I don't like to think, I think it's true. Justified was like a top tier gold level TV show that for some reason flew under the radar. People didn't think of it the same way they thought of like, you know, the Sopranos or breaking bad or mad men. But to me, it was right up there with those shows. I mean, the quality mm-hmm. of the acting, the stories they were telling, it was good stuff. I agree. Uh, other, than, other than season five being a bit of a misfire, I thought that the other season, every other season of the show was was really solid TV. Um, so yeah, we'll oh, definitely man, like, spend some time with that. Like season but, uh, three, I think, it like was at the top of its game. Like season three, I loved. Oh season man, four, season, I loved. Like, season two, three, four. Mm-hmm. Like a trilogy of mm-hmm. awesome TV. Mm-hmm. Like season four... Like every week, that show was blowing me away. Mm-hmm. Like it was just awesome TV. Um, good, definitely good. Yeah, definitely. We'll have to put up. We'll have to mark that down. We got to do a, a justified show. But um, but yeah, thank you for doing this with me. Um, you know, it's like like you were you're noting me offline. It's kind of tough to do these by yourself. You know, you got to have someone yeah. to bounce off of. And uh, you know, the Sausage Factory focuses a lot on on movies. Right. And um, you know, we don't talk about about TV much. That's not really the you know, the subject matter for that show. Um, I'm not saying we wouldn't necessarily talk about movies here. I mean, we did in fact talk about movies a little bit, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of great TV on and um, you know, really, I think what got us talking about it is, you know, we're guys with careers, with families and there's so many things on TV right now that it's sort of hard. Like, how do you decide what you're going to watch? How do you even know Mm -hmm. what's good? You know, I, I didn't actually pick up Fargo until seasons one and two were out. Like oh, wow. Fargo season three is the first one I'm watching, you know, live. Oh, wow. yeah. um, 
and it wasn't because it didn't look good. I mean, heck, the first season had Billy Bob Thornton right. and it had Tim from the British office. And yeah. gosh, I mean, I feel like it had various other characters. I, I just, it, I didn't have time. Yeah. You know, I mean, you look back a few years, what was, what was still on then? I mean, I mean, heck breaking bad might've still been on back then. I don't, I don't, but I mean, how many, how many shows do you have that are like, you know, look, seasons one or two, I, I know they're slow, but just, just wait halfway through season three, it gets really awesome. You know, right. I mean, that's a lot of stuff to watch to get to that point. So right. I really want to invest. It, no, and to, it's true. To, it's to true. get that experience out of it. Right. And, that, you know, that's the other thing. I, I'm hoping what we can do is help people, too, is either give them some sort of anchor that, you know, mm -hmm. if you think something starts slow. A, a show that I would, I would actually highly recommend is The Americans. And I think The Americans mm -hmm. is actually a show like that where it really does come off as kind of like a slow burn. Mm -hmm. But it's very rewarding. And very good. It's it's a really really top top notch quality show, mm -hmm. um, and you know if that doesn't pull you in, there's enough Carrie Russell ass to pull you through <laughs> the episodes. Uh, God, in fact, there's a ton of nudity and sex in that show. Oh, is it um, really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, like Carrie Russell pretty much gets like 100 percent naked, like butt for her nipples in in wow. some episodes. And this is all in FX. Like I don't yeah. know how the hell again they're just like shooting. Oh wow, okay, that's that's a cable show. Angles just oh, to wow. kind of avoid it, but. Um, but now I'm again. I'm I'm sort of joking. There is nudity, and that's not the only reason to watch. It's it's a fantastic <laughs> show. Very very good show. Um, yeah, that's another one that I've been meaning to check out. But right. So we should. Yeah, that's that's definitely one we should cover. But um, sure. but anyway, yeah. So thanks for thanks for appearing with me, Jay. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, hopefully we can mix some other people in in uh, in future installments. But um, any any final words? Uh, no, it's, it's fun stuff, uh, guys. We hope to be doing this on some sort of a, a regular basis. You know, we're both uh, busy guys. We can't really give you any hard, uh, you know, dates yet, but we'd like yeah. to continue this in the future, you know, at least in some fashion. Yeah. So if you, if you like what you saw, definitely subscribe to the channel. Um, it's sort of, again, it's sort of sparse right now. Uh, you know, so it'll have one video and a couple of graphics, but subscribe <laughs> and, and we'll try and, uh, you know, get, get more videos out at least one a week. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think you'll have the good stuff. We'll, we'll talk about some good things again. This, this was sort of the twin peaks episode. That was the big news of the day, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll spread it around here in the weeks to come. Well, thanks a lot, Jay. Thank you for those who I watched. I think there's a lot of sausage factory guys right now, yeah. but you know, the video is going to be up there. You, know, you can catch up whenever, um, we enjoyed having you. I enjoyed talking about Twin Peaks with you, Jay. Nice Absolutely. to talk about it without a hardcore Twin Peaks fan for, for you know, yeah. having yeah. a, you know, we bring in Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart. It's yeah. like, it's like, you know, let's talk to a normal guy for a while. No <laughs> offense, Cameron, you're normal. You're great. It's just, you know, got to talk to the every man every once in a while. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time.